cross-examination of the uh, witness. Would you state your name again for the record, please? Eric Galen Menendez. I'll remind you that you're still under oath. You may continue your cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Menendez, you've testified that your mother and your brother Lyle were about the same size, correct? No, uh, Lyle was roughly two to three inches taller than her. And you indicated that uh, you believed your brother's about 5'11"? 5'10", somewhere around there. And uh, your mother was measured at 5 feet 2 by the coroner, isn't that correct? And that would be impossible. That That's impossible? Yeah. I'm sorry? That mistake. All right, it's uh, objection is sustained to the form of the question. The answer is stricken. If, you're, if the coroner had measured your mother at 62 inches, 5 feet 2, would that be inaccurate? Yes, it would. Now, Mr. Menendez, you indicated, well, first of all, when you said that uh, your mother and your brother were roughly the same size, were you trying to mislead the juries? No, I was not. Into thinking that your mother was bigger than she was? No. To make you more believable when you said you were scared of her? No. You, were you exaggerating? No, I wasn't. <coughs> Mr. Menendez, you said that when you entered into the family room on the 20th of August, you were the first one into that room, correct? Yes, I was. And you indicated that uh, the first person you saw was your father. Uh, yes. And you said that he was standing up? Yes, he was. Do you remember the testimony of your brother who followed you into that room, is that right? Yes, he followed me into the room. Testify that your father was in the process of rising from the couch? No, you I remember don't think that? he said that. You don't think he said that? No, I don't believe so. Would that be accurate? No, it wouldn't. Uh, you've indicated that you fired at the first figure you saw? No, I just started firing as soon as I came in the room. I don't know who I was firing at. And at the time that you first entered that room, you saw your father first, correct? Yes. And you went right into the room? Yes. And did you fire as soon as you got through the threshold of the doors? That's my recollection. I, I don't know exactly at what point I fired. I just remember firing right after I got into the room. Is your recollection that you hit your father first? I don't know. As you entered into the room, you kept firing? Yes. And you indicated that you loaded five cartridges into your shotgun, is that right? Yes, I believe it was five. <laughs> and at first, when you put in the bird shot, you had loaded two cartridges, correct? Yes. And you thought that that was sufficient? At first, before Saturday night, when my dad was banging on the door, and then I realized that I, I thought I was going to die because two shells, it just didn't seem enough for me right then. So that's what you were thinking about when you loaded? When I loaded... When loaded, I loaded your on, five cartridges? Uh, no, on Saturday night, I was thinking, why didn't I load more? And uh, on Sunday, I loaded all the way I could. So that was a, you loaded as many as you could. You're not sure how many you loaded then? As many as I could. Did you hear your brother shooting as you entered? Did he shoot as soon as he came through the doors? I just remember all sorts of noise, uh, banging and so on. I don't remember whether the noise was coming from my gun or from his. Now you remember there was testimony by the uh, autopsy surgeon that there was a contact wound to the back of your father's head, correct? Yes. To the back of his head? Yes. Did you see your brother go behind your father at any time? No, I didn't, I didn't know about that wound until after I was arrested. Where was your brother during the time that you were firing? I, I assumed he was to my right. I didn't, I didn't see him. All I saw was what was right in front of me in the fire. And what was right in front of you? The fire of the gun. All you saw is a flame? Yes. That's what I saw was the flame, not the fire. And you didn't see what you were shooting at? No. I may have at the time. I have no memory of it. I have very little memory of what happened inside there. Why is that? I don't know why that is. Um, now, when you talked to Dr. Ozeal, you told him you had vivid images of what you had done. Is I, that right? I had vivid 
vivid images of what I saw after, uh, but uh, not of what I had done. So all you could see was the flame coming from your gun. You couldn't see where your gun was shooting. I knew it was shooting in front of me, but I didn't know uh, where. What was in front of you? My parents. Now, your father had the contact wound to the back of his head, and you don't remember looking and seeing your brother behind your father? No, I don't, I don't believe he was behind my father. Were you concerned about maybe hitting your brother by accident? If he was behind my father, I might have. Uh, because you were shooting in that direction? Uh, I was just shooting in front of me. If my brother was behind the couch, I would have hit him. I, I really didn't know what I was firing at. I was just firing right in front of me. Did you keep your, your gun in one position, or were you just panning and firing as, you, as, as soon as you could uh, pump that shotgun and, and pull that trigger? I don't know. Did you keep your shotgun stationary and shoot just in one position? I don't remember. I know I ended up in a different position than when I ended the door, but I don't know what happened with the gun while it was firing. Besides the uh, contact wound at the back of your father's head, uh, there was a testimony about uh, your father having a wound to his right shoulder, which fractured his arm. Remember that? Um, no, I don't. Do you remember that uh, shot taking place that night? If it happened, it must have happened. And your father also sustained a wound to his right forearm. Do you remember that shot? No. And a wound to his left elbow, which was back to front, from the rear to the front. Do you remember that shot? No, I don't. Do you remember the shot to his left thigh? The entrance wound would have been to his inside of his thigh and the exit wound on the outside of his thigh. Do you remember that? That I remember seeing afterwards. When did you see that? Uh, when I was picking up the shells or when I went back in the room. I don't remember, but that I remember. <coughs> you remember that specifically? Yeah. Do you remember your brother uh, testifying that as he shot at your father, your father fell back into the uh, sofa, into the couch? No, I don't remember. Into a seated position? I don't know. Now, you were in there at the same time firing your guns, correct? Yes. Why is it that your brother could see your father fall back into the couch and you couldn't see anything? Objection, Your Honor. Calls for speculation. Sustain. You saw what you were doing that day. You saw you, you were shooting at your mother, correct? I, uh, apparently not. You're telling me I didn't. Um, I'm not I telling you anything. I'm asking you what, what you did. You, you're, you're telling me that a shot came from my direction at my dad, and it may have. I don't know. I don't know what happened inside the room. I, I must have shot my mother, and I, I, I guess I shot my dad, too. I, I just don't know. So you, you could have shot your father? Yes. Now, you said that you had five uh, shells in your gun, correct? Yes. And there were five wounds or six areas of wounding to your father and ten to your mother, correct? Yes. Now, was there a preconceived plan on which of you would shoot at your mother and which would shoot at your father? No. Why is it that you didn't take the first person you saw and have uh, your brother go on to your mother? Why I is it that you went off to the left into the room where you would shoot your mother? I, I guess because I got to the door first, I just ran in. We didn't know where exactly my parents were going to be in the room. We thought they were doing something in the room. And I didn't know where they'd be. Isn't it true that you looked into that room before you entered? The, you the door was closed. You cracked that door open to see where your parents were before you entered? No. Now, your mother had a wound to her right cheek and nose. Do you remember that testimony? Uh, yes. And to her right jaw and her right collar bro bone and her teeth were broken out. Remember that? 
I remember him saying that. She also had a wound to her left ear and neck and left shoulder. I don't remember him saying that. And to her right arm, which fractured her arm and forearm. You remember that? No. I'm going to object to this question. It's not clear that he's asking him to remember. All right. Are you referring to the coroner's testimony or the events that night? The events that night. Well, all right. Well, then rephrase the question. Do you remember shooting your mother in the left side of her chest? No. Do you remember shooting your mother in her left hip and thigh area? No. Mr. Menendez, when you were shooting your mother, did she simply stand in front of you and take all the shots that you were administering to her? Object to the form of the question, or there's no proof he shot his mother. Overall. I didn't hear the question. I asked you, sir, whether your mother simply stood in front of you and took all the, the shotgun blasts that you were giving to her. I don't know. You have no idea what she was doing? I didn't see her. As, as soon as I entered the room, I saw her, but as soon as I started firing, I didn't see anyone. I didn't. How, how could that be? Objection calls for speculation. Overall. Objection argumentative. Overall. I guess because the room was dark and because there was so much noise and there was so much fire that, and, and maybe because I don't want to remember. I don't, I don't know why, but I don't remember. Now, can you remember things, I believe you testified, you remember from when you were three years old. You've given these juries a lot of the things that happened when you were three years old and on later in your life. You remember that? I remember a lot more things. Uh, I mean, a lot less things than I remember. Uh, a lot more things happened to me in my life than I will ever remember. But what happened that night uh, when I entered that room, I don't remember. This is a night that you'll never forget. Isn't that true, sir? Yes. And this is a night that you had images of and you described for Dr. Ozeal that you were having nightmares about you and your brother killing your parents, correct? I had images of it every day. Okay. So you, why don't, why don't you explain to the juries what you saw that night then? Objection, Your Honor. Ask the answer. Overall. I entered the room. Uh, I saw two people in the room and I just started firing. And that's what I remember. Let, let's, let's take it step by step, though, so the jurors can understand yeah, what happened. Yeah, it's not a question. All right, just, just ask the question okay. rather than the preface. Mr. Menendez, why don't you try to focus on what you saw that night and describe that to the jury? Objection, Your Honor. Ask and answer. Overall. At what point that night? As you entered and you started to shoot, you see your parents in front of the couch what did you see? I saw my dad on, the, on this side of the coffee table coming forward. I saw my mom on the other side, and then I saw the smoke and the fire of my gun. Now, the initial, let's take one shot at a time then, sir. The initial fire from the gun and the initial smoke didn't cover the whole room, did it? Objection argumentative. Overall. When I walked in the room, I, I was panicking and I just fired every shot I had. I didn't stop to take a look at what I was doing after each shot. I just fired until there was nothing left. And what happened in between when I first started firing, when I, when I ended, is, is, is just a red uh, blank to me. You had never shot that shotgun before, had you? No. And you had to pull that trigger, and you had to pump that pump shotgun before you fired the second shot, correct? Yes. You had to think about what you were doing, didn't you? No. You didn't have to think about that, even though you, you had never shot a shotgun before? No, I, I wasn't thinking <clears throat> about what I was doing. It doesn't, it doesn't, I, I don't know how many times it takes, how long it takes to fire off five rounds, but I don't know, I don't know. You had never shot a shotgun before, is that right? No. This is the first time you had ever shot a shotgun? Yes. 
and you pulled the trigger the first time and it blasted. You heard that blast? Yes. Did you, did you see where it went? No. Where the shot went? No. And then you had to do what? Pump your shotgun? I suppose I would have had to. I don't remember doing it. And then do what? And then I would have had to fire again. And I would have had to keep on doing that until all of the bullets were left, assuming I stopped when the bullets were left. I don't know if I fired more than that. Uh, I just don't remember. Do you know what position your gun was when you first fired it? I don't know. I assume it was in front of me. Was it at your hip? Did you have it up at your shoulder? Where did you have it? I, I guess I had it at my side. I, I really don't remember. I don't remember these things. And your mother was hit also in the left hip and thigh, and the left lower leg, and the left calf. Now, <laughs> all right. Let's uh, that, ask a question, please. Mr. Menendez. You heard the testimony of the autopsy surgeon that your mother was shot in the left lower leg and the left calf, correct? Correct? I don't remember that. <clears throat> At any time did you realize that your mother had fallen to the floor in front of the couch, between the couch and the uh, coffee table? No. Well, you, you need to understand this happened in such a rush, so quickly, that it was over within seconds. Three seconds, and... Were you timing this, sir? No, I wasn't. But How do you it just know what... It just happened so fast. Before I knew it, I, I was... I was... It was over. I was standing there, and it was over. And uh, I don't remember what happened in between. Sir, are you saying that in three seconds, you and your brother could inflict ten shotgun wounds on your mother and six on your father in three seconds? Is that what you're saying? That's what it seemed like to me. Maybe it was... Four, maybe it was two, but it was. Maybe it was it, two seconds. I, I, it was, it was just, it just happened so quickly that I don't, I don't have a memory of, of these individual shots. I, I just don't. I don't want to have a memory, and uh, I may have had a memory the night after or the night after that. I don't remember having those memories, but I know I was so haunted that, uh, that I just couldn't deal with the memories, and I, I don't know. So it's not that you didn't see what was happening. You just don't want to remember. Is that right? You had stated that it was too dark. Yes, yeah, so let's have one question at a time. Question is then, sir. You saw what was happening, and you can remember what was happening, but you don't want to testify here as to what was happening. No, that's not true. If I remembered, I would have to testify here. But I don't remember. I don't remember ever having the memories. But I know that... Uh, the memories were so awful that I have forgotten a lot of what happened. Have you thought about that over the last four years, about what happened that night? Uh, every day. Have you tried to jog your memory as to what happened when you and your brother entered into that uh, room and surprised your parents? Have you thought about that? No. I definitely have not tried to jog my memory. I've tried to forget. I've worked a lot in therapy and taken a lot of medication so I could forget because I don't want to remember. And uh, I definitely have not tried to remember. Uh, does that uh, therapy and um, medication uh, make you forget about all the other things that you've experienced? Or you have a good memory of everything else? I really don't have a good memory of everything else. Uh, so many things happened to me that I don't remember. Uh, but about that night, I don't remember. The things you've testified to, is that a figment of your imagination then, in this trial? No. Is that based on, on um, things that you would like to have hap happened, that you could testify to? I definitely would rather that the things that happened to me had not happened, that's well, for sure. This therapy, you say, and this medication you're on, that makes you forget about this night that you went in there and shot your parents, what effect does that have on the other things you've testified about? The, the, the therapy and the medication doesn't make me forget. The medication allows me to deal with it, allows me to talk here today, but the therapy helps me deal with these things. Um, it, nothing in therapy 
wants me to forget things. Okay, That's maybe I was mistaken. I thought you testified that the therapy and medication helps you to forget that night. Is that what you testified? Uh, if to? I said that, I misspoke. That's not what I meant. So the therapy and medication are not impeding your your memory with respect to that night. No, they're definitely not impeding it. No. Okay. That's something that you just want to do. I'm I'm sorry. That's something that you want to do. What is what? Forget about what happened that night. Yes, I'd like to completely forget about it. But we can't do that. We have to have testimony with respect to what you did that night. So can you try to think about what happened that night. Is that a question? All right. The, it is a question. What is your answer? I that I I know I have to remember and and I don't remember. My attorneys ask me over and over and I don't remember. I just don't remember what happened when I walked in the room and there's nothing more that I can I can tell you. Do you remember shooting and missing your parents. There were two shots that went into the French doors behind your parents. Do you remember that? No. Objection overruled. No, I don't. Do you have any idea how your mother sustained ten wounds and your father six areas of wounds if you only had five uh, cartridges in your shotgun? No, I don't. You don't know how that could have happened? No. At some point, did you go to where your mother was uh, lying between the uh, sofa and the uh, uh, coffee table no. and shoot her there? No, I didn't. Do you have any idea how many um, shotgun shells your brother had in his, uh, his gun? No, I do not. Now take a look in, take, would you take a look at the lower right hand corner, the photograph, I believe it's uh, exhibit 95. It shows a photograph of your father's legs and then your mother is, is lying down. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now there's um, There are some wounds on her leg, isn't that right? And the coroner testified about the uh, wounds on her leg. Yes. Now, with respect to the l left lower leg, there was a graze wound about 10 inches above the left heel, the coroner testified. And it was a front to back wound, and it was an upward direction. Do you remember? That question, Your Honor? Do you remember that testimony? No, I don't. Can you explain for these juries how your mother uh, could have gotten a wound on her lower left leg in an upward direction if you were shooting on the other side of the coffee table at her? I have no idea how she got any of the wound, uh, wounds. Um, I, have, I really don't have any idea. There were, there were shots from my brother and from me all over the place. And uh, okay, I have no idea how any of the wounds happened. Now, when you say there were shots from you and your brother all over the place, did you move around so that the uh, coffee table could not uh, or would not impede um, your shots? I, I remember ending up between the TV and the coffee table, but I guess I, I was firing from the door to there, but I don't understand your question by move around. The question is, after your mother suffered the initial gunshot, shotgun blasts, and fell to the ground. Did you go over and shoot her more while she lay there? No. You did not? I definitely did not do that. Now, if your father had the wounds that the uh, coroner had testified to, he would not have had any more um, ammunition to fire at your mom, your mother, on the ground. Your Isn't Honor, that right? This is argument. It's not the uh, proper question as okay. raised. Do you have any idea? Well, Your Honor, I object to this line as calling for an expertise that my client doesn't have. Objection overruled as to the question has been asked yet. Mr. Menendez, at any time did you go closer to your mother so that you'd have a clear shot of her between the coffee table and the sofa? No. 
Was the coffee table always in front of you as you shot at your mother? Yes. Did you have to shoot over the coffee table? I assume. You assume? Yeah. After you initially entered into the room and stopped, as you said, in front of the television set, is that right? Mm-hmm. Did you just stay right there and continue firing? I don't know. You don't know what you did? I don't know what I was doing when I was firing. I know where I ended up, and that's between the coffee table and the TV. What I did in between, I don't know. It could be then that you went and you uh, shot your mother as she lay between the coffee table and the sofa. You just don't remember that. I, I doubt that could be. Why is but that? I don't remember that. But uh, you're saying you're asking me if I ran all the way to the coffee table and then all the way back around the room. That that didn't happen. So you remember exactly what you did? No. Rephrase the question. You do remember things that you did then? No, I don't. I can, I can tell you that I'm sure that I didn't run around the room. Uh, I'm sure that I just ran from the door straight in front of the coffee table. But uh, I just don't remember. You know that you weren't wasting time by running around the room. You went directly to where you could uh, do the most damage. Wouldn't that be fair? Overall. No, I wasn't thinking like that. I ran in that room in such a state that I just wanted to fire off that, that gun as fast as possible. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know where I was going to shoot or how I was going to shoot or any of that. I wasn't, re I wasn't, this wasn't going through my mind. Okay, Mr. Menendez, when you went in there, you said all you wanted to do was shoot your gun, correct? Yes. You didn't take your gun and fire your five shots into the ceiling, did you? No, I didn't. You knew you wanted to kill your parents, isn't that right? I wanted to shoot at them, yes. You wanted to what? I wanted to shoot at them. Okay. And that was your goal as you entered into that room that night? I, I don't... I, 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 the, the last thought I have of entering the room was the fear that one of them was going to be able to take my gun. I assume that was the goal if I, I, I ran in there <coughs> to shoot them, but I don't, I don't have a specific memory of the goal. I don't have a specific memory of what I did when I was inside the room. I just don't have it. Sir, you were inside your house, you got your gun, you were armed, you ran down the stairs, you ran past the uh, family room, you ran out the foyer, outside of your house, you went to your car, correct? Yes. You loaded your gun as much as you could. Yes. And you were scared that someone was going to take your gun away from you as you entered that door. Yes, that was the last thought I had. You, you, you need to understand who my parents are and, and how strong they are, especially how quick my dad is. And, and this was a small room, and this was a big gun, and I was, it, was just, it just flashed through my mind. All kinds of things flashed through my mind. I didn't think about these thoughts. These were just thoughts that flashed through my mind. I didn't think about what my goal was. I was just, I was just acting. And, and from as soon as what happened in the foyer, I, I panicked and, and I just burst into that room and I started firing as much as I could, but I can't tell you what happened inside the room. So when those doors closed to the family room and your father said he was going to finish watching television. He didn't say that. You went upstairs and you did all these purposeful movements, all these purposeful actions in order to catch them by surprise. They thought I was waiting up in my room for my dad to come up and have sex with me. That's what I'm sure they were thinking and, and that's what they were about to do. And I, I, just, I just thought, I just panicked. I so thought you were, I was going to die and I just, I just, I ran and I loaded as much as I could. Now, let, let's, um, Let's try to clarify that. You thought your father was going to come up and have sex with you. Yes. You didn't think he was going to come and kill you? No, I definitely thought he was going to come and kill me. He you just wasn't going to do that in front of the family with everyone knowing and my mom knowing right there and my brother knowing right there. That, that wasn't going to happen. What wasn't going to happen? Him just coming up to my room to do that in front of everyone. So you went out and when you were outside and you had a loaded gun you decided, I've got to go back in there, but I'm afraid that they might take my gun away from me as I enter in, into that room. That, that thought 
went through my mind uh, right before I ran into the room. And that was I was out of the car. And your brother had a loaded gun right behind you? Yes. And it was a fully loaded pump shotgun? Yes. And you had your backup with you? Yes. Do you remember the testimony of Diane Vandermolen? Uh, I believe it was in 1983. Testified that you and your brother uh, tied her up and tried to take her clothes off. Remember that testimony? Yes. Were you acting in self-defense there too? No, we were goofing around. You were acting with. You were acting. Approach on this issue. No. You were acting in concert with your brother then too, weren't you? Objection for request. This that was a. Uh, some goofing around that I did with my cousin when I was 10 years old. I, uh, in 1983, you were 13 years old, weren't you? You were born did in 1973. Did you say 83? Uh, all right, then I was 11 years old. Um, but this wasn't something that, that I was acting in self-defense with, no. Something you and your brother did together? Uh, yes. And he was with you on this night, too. Yes, he was. And are you saying that there was no discussion whatsoever about which one of you would shoot which parent? Asked and answered. We didn't know where my parents were in the room. We thought my parents were coming out. We thought they had guns. We weren't, we weren't thinking, my mom's here, my dad's here, you do this, you do that. That, that did not even cross my mind. Mr. Menendez. Certainly was no discussion about it. Mr. Menendez, your brother testified, or you testified that your brother had been into the room where they are watching TV. So there was no speculation as to what they were doing in that room, was there? Objection. You knew what they were doing in the room. Rephrase the question, please. You had testified that your brother was in the family room just minutes before you burst in there with your brother to kill them. And they, they were watching television, weren't they? No, they weren't. No, they weren't. You told these juries that you never, asked, in four years, you never asked your brother about that. So how can you testify that they weren't? My brother and I. Objection not. argumentative, Your Honor. Please raise the question, please. Okay. Sir, didn't you testify that in the past four years, you never asked your brother what he saw in that room prior to you and your brother bursting into that room? My brother and I didn't have discussions about what happened that night. We didn't, I, I never talked to him really about it. I, maybe. A week later, I told him I was having trouble dealing with it and so on, but I, I certainly never had discussions about what was happening uh, inside that room when he walked in or what happened after we started firing or anything like that. Sir, we just didn't want to talk about that. Sir, you were out on the streets for seven months before you were arrested on this case. So you mean to say that you never talked about that in those seven months that you were on the streets? Argumentative. We talked about a lot of things, and we talked about the fear we had that weekend, but we definitely didn't talk about what happened inside that room. It's not something that I wanted to talk about. I wanted to forget it. I wanted not to, to do it because it was coming back to me. Um, I mean, at everything that I was doing during the day, it was right there in front of me. I could smell the smoke. I could I could hear the fire, and I just didn't want to do, deal with it. Now, in the three and a half years that you've been in custody with your brother, you've been in the cell right next door to him for months at a time. Isn't that correct, sir? No. I was with him, uh, next to him, for about two months. And ever since then, they've kept us in separate parts of the jail. Now, you were next to him in, in 7,000, that module? No, I was not in the cell next to him. Which module were you in when you were next to your brother? Uh, in 3,100 in and you never talked about what happened that night with him during that period of time, did you? Once we entered the room, never. And in fact, uh, you and your brother are taken from this courthouse to the Men's Central Jail in a van, correct? Yes, we are. And you're the only two inmates on that van? No, there's two deputies sitting right in front of us driving us. OK, you ever talk on the, the bus? Not if we don't want the deputies to hear us. Are you seated right next to the deputies? Uh, we're separated on the van. There's a, uh, a metal sheet in between us. Um, Lyle is separated, put right in front of the deputy, I mean right behind the deputies, uh, directly behind him, and I'm put uh, behind that, behind the metal sheet. Are you saying that over the, the past four years you never asked him what he saw in that room? I don't want to know what he saw in that room. I don't want to know. 
I don't want to deal with it. I, I, it's, it's something that I will never forget. It's something that I will always have with me, and I don't want to know. I certainly never asked him. Now, what you did that night had been planned for some time, hadn't it? No, it hadn't. Do you remember seeing a movie about uh, three weeks before the killings? No. A movie on the Billionaire Boys Club, sir? No, I never saw that movie. You know anything about that movie? Yes, I know a lot about the actual uh, case. I don't know a lot about the movie, but I know a lot about the actual case. And there was a father. Your Honor, I'm going to object. May we approach at this point? Yes. Mr. Menendez, uh, with respect to this BBC movie, you recall that Dr. Ozeal testified that uh, you had indicated that you had seen this movie on the BBC? Uh, the question, rephrase the question, please. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that you had seen this movie on the BBC? What movie? Objection of the law. The Billionaire Boys Club movie. Dr. Ozeal didn't testify to that. Do you remember telling him about what you call the BBC movie? No. Do you know what the BBC is? Yeah, he said that I saw a movie on the BBC, and uh, I never said that. You never told him that? No, I definitely never told him that. Did you ever see that movie? Which movie? The Billionaire Boys Club movie, sir. N no, I didn't. Never seen it? No, I never saw the movie. Did Dr. Ozeal make up some initials like that and say that you told him that you had seen the movie on the BBC? Which movie are you referring to? A movie that Dr. Ozeal says I saw or this Billionaire Boys Club movie? You realize that that's the same movie, don't you, sir? Objection. No, it isn't. Overall. It isn't. OK, why don't you tell us what it is? Dr. Ozeal, and I read it very carefully because I wanted to know what he was going to testify in court, said that I saw a movie on the BBC or a, uh, a movie on the BBC special. Um, and then when I heard you bring up the Billionaire Boys Club movie in court, you were linking them together, but that's not what he was saying. What were you referring to when you said the BBC movie? I never said a BBC movie. Well, how do you know what Dr. Ozeal was referring to if you don't know what he was talking about, sir? Because he said a movie on the BBC, and clearly he's talking about on the British Broadcasting. Now, you've used that term yourself, haven't you, sir? BBC? Yes. Yes. What did you refer to it as? I'm going to object at this point in time. Overall. Well, Your Honor, I'd object to the Overall. Sir, what did you refer to it as? When, when, when I was having a conversation with Craig Signorelli. Your Honor, I'm going to renew the objection. Overall. Uh, he said something about BBC, and I said, uh, yeah, like the BBC. Now, B were you talking about the British Broadcasting Company, sir? When I was talking to Craig, no. Yes. What were you referring to? I was referring to uh, the case of the Billionaire Boys Club. So you knew that BBC stood for the Billionaire Boys Club, correct? Those are the initials of BBC, yes. And when you told Dr. Ozeal that you had seen a movie on the BBC, you knew exactly what you were talking about. You knew it was a Billionaire Boys Club, isn't I, that correct, sir? I never told Dr. Ozeal that. Now, why is it that you think now, if you never told him that, why is it that you think he was not referring to the Billionaire Boys Club, sir? Because if he says that I told him about this movie that you're referring to, I wouldn't have called it the BBC. I would have said the name of the movie. That's not what he said. He said that I said a movie on the BBC. When Fred Signorelli mentioned the BBC, did you say, no, Craig, I'm talking about the British Broadcasting Company. Is that what you said? No. Your Honor, I'm going to object again on this subject matter with regard to conversation right. with Mr. Signorelli. Objection overruled. Sir? Yes, you, you've got me confused. Which conversation are you when now Mr. referring to? Mr. Signorelli mentioned the BBC. You knew exactly what he was talking about, correct? What date is it? That, uh, this is November 29th, 1989. Yes, I knew what he was talking about. And you didn't correct him and say, no, that's the Billionaire Boys Club. You knew exactly what he was talking about. Yes. Correct? Mm-hmm. And you were thinking about forming your own corporation at that time, correct? You're not going to object again. Sustain.
Did you at any time during your uh, sessions uh, with Dr. Ozeal ever mention this movie on the BBC? Objection, Your Honor. 1016. All right, rephrase the question, please. With respect to those sessions on October 31st, 1989, and November 2nd, 1989, did you ever mention seeing the BBC movie and talking to Dr. Ozeal about how the father in that movie reminded you of yours? No. You never mentioned that at all? I never said that to him. Was there, any, was there ever <clears throat> any conversation when your brother was present at either of those two sessions that we've just related <coughs> where that was discussed? Uh, it could not have been discussed in, when Lyle was there. It certainly wouldn't have been discussed there because in that conversation, we were specifically not talking about um, things that happened before. Sir, would it be fair to say then that you had uh, disclosed a lot of things to Dr. Ozeal before your brother shut you up? Yeah, I, I talked about uh, a lot about what happened uh, in terms of where we bought the guns and, and what happened after my parents died and so on. And you also had a discussion with him about your brother and you planning the killings, correct? Before your brother got there. No, that's not true. Now you indicated that after your brother arrived, you understood him to be quite upset with you. Isn't that correct? Uh, yeah, he was. Now, you heard your brother testify that you and he had conversations about your mother and father deciding between themselves and among themselves that they would be the ones to kill you and your brother because it would be less of a risk, because they would be the ones to actually do the crime. Remember that? Yeah, I think that's what you're talking about. Do you understand the question? No, I don't know. Yourself. Do you remember your brother testifying that he and you discussed whether your mother and father would kill themselves or get somebody to kill for them? Remember that? Would, would kill themselves? Would kill you two themselves or hire somebody else. When are you asking that we had this conversation? Did you have that conversation? I, uh, I think at one point during that week, uh, maybe Thursday or something, we may have had some sort of conversation like that, but I don't remember. Isn't it I certainly true? didn't think that someone else was going to hire, uh, they were going to hire someone else to kill us until my mom mentioned that the fishing boat trip had changed, and then I thought it was a possibility. Uh, isn't it true that the two of you discussed how it would be a lot safer for the two of you to kill your parents so that no one else would know. It would, you would only have to rely on the two of you. You could hold the secret. Did you ever discuss that? No. I'm not, even, I'm not clear what you're saying. Well, let's go a step further. When you went to Dr. Ozeal on October 31st, 1989, and you disclosed what you and your brother had done as far as planning out the killings and watching the BBC movie, when your brother arrived, he realized that now it wasn't the perfect murder, now somebody else knew. And the risk was only between you two. Objection, Your Honor. Compound argumentative cost for speculation. Rephrase the question. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Menendez, did you discuss doing the killing yourselves, you and your brother? No. Never discussed that? No. You mean before my parents died, Lau and I had a discussion that we're going to kill our parents ourselves? Yes. No, that never happened. Was there any discussion about it would be safe because it would only be the two of you? You wouldn't have to rely on somebody else who might tell the police what you did? You mean hire somebody else? Yes. No, we certainly never had any conversations like that. So it was always the plan that you two would do the killings? No. Now, when you went into Dr. Ozeal's um, office on the 31st of October, and as you indicated, you were depressed and you felt bad about what you had done, and you had spent about an hour and a half with him, and you told him what you did, you told him how it was all planned out. Then when your brother got there, he was upset, wasn't he? Objection, Your Overall. I didn't go to Dr. Ozeal to tell him. I went to Dr. Ozeal because I was ready to kill myself and because my cousin Henry said, I don't, I'm, I, I don't feel comfortable with you feeling like this. I want you to get 
some therapy or some help. That's why I went to Dr. Ozeal. When he wasn't understanding why I wanted to kill myself and why I had so much grief over my parents dying, that's when I realized I had to tell him. But there certainly was never a conversation with him about the BBC movie that you're referring to or uh, planning. And that's when Lyle got to the session, he had no idea what I told Dr. Ozeal anyway. Now, Mr. Menendez, before your brother got there, you had been with Dr. Ozeal for about an hour and a half, correct? No, I think I had been with Dr. Ozeal for close to two and a half hours or something like that. So you had plenty of time to explain what you and your brother had done. We didn't get to that until after he called Lyle and told him to come over. Before that, the two hours were basically talking about my feelings um, before I ever told him uh, that we killed our parents. Now, your brother was upset with you for having told Dr. Ozeal what you and he had done, correct? Yes. He was upset? Yeah, he was uh, definitely uh, upset. He was uh, frightened that Dr. Ozeal would go to the police. He was, yeah, he was upset. At that point, did you realize that you had done something wrong you shouldn't have told Dr. Ozeal? I realized that before he got there when Dr. Ozeal uh, didn't, didn't care about why I was there and my, why I was depressed and just was basically asking me the details. And, and as soon as he started asking me why, <coughs> right after he called Lyle, I started thinking to myself, I had made a mistake because Lyle's not going to be happy with me and I shouldn't have told Dr. Ozeal this. And I thought that before Lyle got there, though. And now Dr. Ozeal knew what you and your brother had done. Yes. And you told these juries that you always wanted to get caught. The seven months that you were out, free on the streets, you wanted to get caught. Yet when uh, you told Dr. Ozeal, you were afraid that he was going to go to the police so that you would get caught. And you didn't want that to happen, did you? Objection. No. I, I never said that I wanted to get caught. I, I definitely always thought I would get caught. And a part of me wanted to get punished for this. I no longer had my parents to put me in my room and hit me. I no longer had them to, to do things to me that they had done all my life. And I felt guilty that they weren't able to do this. I, I definitely uh, felt like that, but I definitely didn't want to go to jail. That wasn't something that I had looked forward to or had wanted to do. When your brother got uh, to the session with Dr. Ozeal, he was very upset with you, wasn't he? Yes. And you didn't tell him exactly what you had told Dr. Ozeal because you didn't want him to get mad at you. Isn't that correct? Uh, no, uh, no, Dr. Ozeal was going to tell Lyle what I had told him, but Lyle cut him off and said that he didn't want to know. So since Dr. Ozeal didn't tell your brother what you had told him, Dr. Ozeal, you weren't going to tell him what you told him. You, you were just going to say, I told him we did it, but I didn't tell him any of the details. Because you didn't want him mad at you, did you? No, I, I actually, uh, later that night at my house, he had asked me what I told Dr. Ozeal. And I basically uh, told him what I told Dr. Ozeal. Basically? Yeah, I mean, I was crying at the time, and I was just spurting out what I said to Dr. Ozeal in a rush. So that night, you recounted two and a half hours that you had spent with Dr. Ozeal, and you told your brother even though he was mad that you went to Dr. Ozeal in the first place, you told him every single thing that you told Dr. Ozeal earlier that day. Is that right? No, I'm talking about just um, that we had killed my parents uh, and, and the details of exactly what we did afterwards and so on is what I, uh, I told Lyle. I didn't tell him, I guess, everything. I don't remember exactly what I told him. But okay. the first two and a half hours were just about me and my suicide and so on. I, I just told Lyle that, I guess, in a sentence. I don't remember. You didn't explain to your brother what you had told Dr. Ozeal. That'd be fair to say? Which part of what I told Dr. Ozeal are you asking that I explained to Lyle? I certainly explained to Lyle some of the things I had told Dr. Ozeal, yes. OK, you, you explained some of the things, but you didn't tell him the detail um, in which you told Dr. Ozeal about uh, what you had done, what you and your brother had done. I didn't give Dr. Ozeal uh, an enormous amount of detail. Mr. Menendez, I gave him very how, little. how is it that Dr. Ozeal had all these specific things that you had done, which have been corroborated and verified here, 
if you had not told him what you had done. Objection, right. Your Honor. Argumentative. Assistant. Uh, let's take a recess and then we'll uh, resume at um, 11 o'clock. Don't discuss the matter with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about it. We'll resume at 11. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Menendez, um, drawing your attention to the October 31st, 1989 meeting or session that you had with Dr. Ozeal, is it your testimony that you never mentioned a BBC television show? Yes. But you indicated you are familiar with the uh, BBC television show. I'm aware of its existence. It's a miniseries, I believe. And uh, you knew about it, its existence before October 31st of 1989. Is that correct? Oh, yes. And the Billionaire Boys Club movie involved uh, the son being involved in killing the father. Is that right? Uh, it's about the real case and the yeah, it's about the real case. Do you remember watching that with your brother? No, I never watched that with my brother. Do you remember where you were on July uh, 31st, 1989? I believe I was at Saddlebrook Country Club in Florida. Is that in Tampa, Florida? Uh, yeah, I was, I was down there in a training camp, uh, both at my Aunt Martha's and there. In fact, your brother was there also during that, on that day, wasn't he? I'm not sure if he was there at that time or on the time the week before that I was there. I know he was there one of those, one of those times. Do you remember telling Dr. Ozeal that after watching this movie uh, with your brother, that you and your brother had a discussion about uh, doing away with the controlling influence of, in your life, the person that dominated you and trapped you and prevented you from doing what you wanted to do. Did you discuss that with your brother? Did I discuss that with my brother? Yes. Or, the killing you, of your father after watching Are you saying on the 31st or? Sometime after the 31st of July, yes. After watching oh. this movie. Oh, we didn't watch the movie. But we had talked about, uh, on Tuesday we talked on Friday, we talked about uh, a lot about what the family uh, was like now and about uh, mom and dad's relationship and how things changed. The question I asked, though, did you talk about, after, the, after this movie, did you talk about getting rid of the controlling influence of, in your life, the person that dominated you and prevented you from doing what you wanted to do? Did you have that discussion with your brother? I. I don't use those words. Those are words that Dr. Ozeal uses. Um, but I, I may have had, uh, we had conversations about the family. Uh, and about the family, your father was a controller of you. Is that fair yes. to say? Yes, we, we were talking about how uh, dad's ideas uh, for what he wanted for us were now beginning to change and, and cut off and uh, how mom had, had, had really changed a lot. We, we were talking about a lot of different things. Now, when you said uh, your father's plans for you, something about getting cut off, what did you mean by that? It means that he was cutting off the tennis, uh, although he hadn't decided if he was cutting off the tennis, but uh, that he wanted me now to go more into uh, law and uh, business schools and go on into business with him and so on. And as you testified in direct examination, your father really controlled your life. Yes, correct? completely. And he was going to decide what you would do as far as your um, career? Yes, he would. Where you would live? Yes. Afterwards, this compound on an island in Florida? Yes. And uh, he would probably, as your brother testified, he would tell your brother who he could marry? Yes. And was really in on everything, every aspect of your lives, correct? Yes. And uh, you told Dr. Ozeal that he was too controlling and that after watching the movie about this uh, young man being involved in killing his own father, his wealthy father, you decided, you discussed it with your brother that you and he would get rid of your father. No, uh, it was actually Dr. Ozeal telling me this in that session. He was telling me what he knew about dad. He didn't know so much about mom, but um, he thought he knew a lot. 
and uh, he was talking about after I said I didn't know why, what uh, what he felt. He understood uh, what I was saying. Mr. Menendez, do you want? Are you saying here that you simply went in and said, Lyle and I shotgunned our parents to death, but I don't know why, and mm -hmm. stopped at that? No, that's not at all what happened. You, you testified just before we broke that you told Dr. Ozeal in detail everything that happened after the killings, correct? Objection mistakes the testimony. Overall. Is that what you testified uh, to? I testified to something like that, not exactly those words. That you told him exactly what happened after the killings, but <coughs> you never mentioned what happened before the killings. No, I mentioned that we bought shotguns in San Diego. Uh, once he asked me, I told him that we ran into the room, and he asked me, well, where did we get the shotguns, and why haven't the police found out? And I said that I thought they uh, would have already because of my brother's, fr my brother's friend's ID. But that's not why I went to the session. I didn't go to the session to tell him that I killed my parents and then not to tell him why. Uh, that's not at all what happened. Once you went to the session and started to confess that you and your brother had uh, committed the killings, then you started to discuss what happened before the killings. Isn't that right? Uh, no. Uh, at that point, he asked me who knew, uh, what did the police knew, what did people uh, know about my brothers and my involvement, and what evidence there were, and that sort of thing. And then he got on the phone and, uh, and he called Lyle. Now remember that you told Dr. Ozeal that uh, once the two of you began and you saw this plot to this BB BBC special that mirrored what you intended to do to your father, you simply included the plans in those plans to kill your mother because your mother would have been depressed and suicidal. And if, they kill, if you killed your father, she would be a potential witness. Do you remember telling Dr. Ozeal that? Uh, no, I, I didn't. I, I knew what the case of the Billionaire Boys Club was about, and the father suffocated in a trunk. Um, it had n nothing to do with what we wanted to do. And certainly, this, this stuff about, you, you said something about my mother being a witness, or we couldn't kill my father without that. Or, I'm not, could, you, could you repeat it again? Yes, I believe you. Dr. Ozeal indicated that you had told him about this BBC special about the son being involved in killing his wealthy father, that uh, once you saw that, you and your brother start, started to discuss how your father was similar to the father as depicted in that movie, and that you discussed how to get rid of your own father. Isn't that right? Uh, is that what he says I said? Is that what you're asking? Right. Is that what you said? No, that's not what I said. I, I also think he said I mirrored the movie. Is that, is that what he said? I, I'm, I'm really unclear. If you could show me exactly what he said, I, could, I could just go down the list and tell you what I didn't say and what, what actually happened. Do you remember talking to Dr. Ozeal about your motivation for killing your parents? Uh, yeah. And part of that motivation was to get rid of the controlling, uh, dominating force in your life, your father, correct? Yeah, that's what he was saying that I didn't understand. Um, he was telling me, once I said I didn't know, and he asked me, well, when did you guys first, uh, when did the idea first come up, or something like that, he was telling me that I didn't understand. He was telling me that, that I wasn't very bright and that it was so confusing an issue because it had to do with all these psychological ramifications that that this is why it happened, and that through therapy and hypnosis, I'll begin to understand. Mr. Menendez, did he tell you that you saw the Billionaire Boys Club movie? That's why you did it? Did no, he tell th you that? that was never discussed in the session. So when the discussion occurred about the Billionaire Boys Club movie, you knew about that movie before you ever talked to Dr. Ozeal, correct? Objection, this takes the testimony. Rephrase around. the question, please. <clears throat> Had you known about the Billionaire Boys <clears throat> Club movie before you ever talked to Dr. Ozeal on October 31st, 1989? Yes, I did. And so when he said that you spoke about the movie, he wasn't making that up, was he? Objection, Doc Dr. Ozeal never spoke about that. Objection overruled. Dr. Ozeal never testified that I saw the Billionaire Boys Club. And, uh, and I don't think that, that he, he, I mean, I'm really uh, 
confusing the issues. That was never talked about in this session. Any movie was not brought up in this session. Mr. Menendez, you heard Dr. Ozeal testify that you had discussed seeing a movie on the BBC. Yes. And now you're acting as though you don't have any idea what that means, is that Objection right? Objection argumentative. Rephrase the question. Mr. Menendez, are you telling these juries that you have no idea uh, what the BBC movie referred to? Objection, Your Honor. That's also argumentative. And calls for second uh, BBC stands for a lot of things. One possibility is certainly the Billionaire Boys Club, but I don't believe that's what Dr. Ozeal testified to is all that I'm saying. Was there some other movie that aired a couple weeks before uh, the killings that had to do with the son killing his father other than the Billionaire Boys Club movie, sir? All, all that I'm saying, sir, is that Dr. Ozeal did not testify that I saw the BBC movie. He testified that I saw a movie on the BBC or a BBC special. This BBC movie that you're referring to is also a miniseries. It's not a movie. And that's all that I'm trying to tell you. How do you know that? Because I know about the movie. I, I was friends with a kid whose brother was involved in it. And he used to talk about how his brother was innocent. And this was a frame up of some other thing. And I, I knew about the case. You knew one of the sons of the father who was killed in the Billionaire Boys Club movie, didn't you? Your yes, Honor, I did. Your Honor, I'm going to object at this point. So with all this information and knowledge that you had about this movie, are you still saying that uh, you didn't know what Dr. Ozeal referred to when he testified about the movie on the BBC, sir? All that I'm... That calls for speculation. <coughs> and is irrelevant. All right. Uh, rephrase the question. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Menendez, you've testified that you knew this movie was a miniseries. Mm -hmm. You knew one of the sons of the father that was actually killed by the B BBC. And are you telling these jurors that you don't know what Dr. Ozeal was referring to when he said that you spoke of watching this movie on the BBC? The overruled. Objection overruled. The first time that I ever thought that Dr. Ozeal might be referring to this movie was when you brought it up here in court that Dr. Ozeal was referring to the Billionaire Boys Club. And you said it was a miniseries on the Billionaire Boys Club. I knew about the case from 1986 when I had watched uh, a 60 minute program with my father. I mean, I knew about the case for years. I certainly didn't need to watch a movie to know about the case. So that gave you the idea? Watching a 60 minute program with my dad? Right. <coughs> no. Now, what were you talking about when you said that you saw this plot, this movie on the BBC, that you and your brother discussed the father depicted in that movie reminded you of your own father. I never said that. The father in the, in the movie was, I assume you're talking about Bryant's father, and he had, he was nothing like my father. He was. But, I mean, I don't know what the movie portrayed the father to be is what I'm saying, but Brian told me a lot about his own father. Now, you knew his father was a millionaire. His father was a... Uh, you can object to this cause for hearsay. Sustain. What is your understanding about the father, since you know about him? All right, let's move on to something else. Okay. After you and your brother planned out the, the killing of your mother and father and burst into the room and did the shooting that you say you can't recall today, you and your brother emptied the shotguns and you, I believe you said that after you finished firing every round in your gun, you ran out to your car, correct? Objection, I request you just calm down. Overall. Is that right uh, so far? No, you're not right so far. Why don't you tell us what happened? Objection, uh, calls for a narrative answer. Sustain. After you finished emptying your shotgun, your pump shotgun, into your mother and father, what did you do? Object to the question that assumes that's not in the other Overall. All right, you're saying 
after uh, we killed our parents, what exactly did we do? Yes. We went out to the foyer, and, and eventually uh, Lyle came over to me and sat down next to me. After you finished emptying your guns, what did you do? Lyle and I went out to the foyer, and he sat down next to me. Now, isn't it true, sir, that you went out to your car and you helped your brother reload? Oh, I thought you were talking about after that. Yes, that happened first. And then Lyle ran back in the room, and I went to the stairs, and I sat down there. Now, are you sure that your brother, you handed your brother only one shotgun cartridge? Your Honor, this was asked to dance. Overall. Your Honor, did we approach? No. Let me answer, uh, sir. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm fairly sure. When you say fairly sure, could it have been more? I don't believe so. <coughs> so it's your understanding there was only one? Yes. <clears throat> you heard your brother testify that he went back into the room and reached over the coffee table and um, shot your mother in the cheek, correct? Objection on that mistake testimony Overall. Um, is that what Lyle testified to? Do you recall that? No. Did he tell you what he did? No, he never told me what he did. You heard the last shot? Yes. You saw him come out? Yes. He didn't say, I finished her off? Certainly not. Did he say something to you after that? He said nothing. He just sat down in the archway of the... Uh, of the living room went out across from me on the stairs. And you were on the stairs? Yes. <clears throat> and then you had a conversation with him? Uh, within a few minutes, he came over because I was shaking, and I, uh, he said, it's going to be all right. He said, it'll be all right. Let's just uh, go back and pick up all the shotgun shells, and let's do as we had planned. Let's go to the uh, Taste of L.A. No. Uh, I, at that point, I said, that I didn't, uh, maybe the police were, weren't coming and I didn't want to talk to the police and maybe they weren't coming. And, uh, and some words were exchanged about maybe I was right, maybe they weren't coming. And, uh, and that's when Lyle went to get his gun and, uh, and I think he was walking out of the foyer when we uh, uh, went to pick up the shells. Your brother was walking out of the house, and you, then you decided to pick up the shells? He was walking out of the foyer, and it was at that moment after he had <coughs> retrieved his gun that uh, the idea about picking up the shells came up. Isn't it true that you had planned to pick up the evidence beforehand? No, it was uh, definitely not planned to pick up the shells. There, I mean, looking back, I realized that I was just in a, in a, in a strange state, and that there was no reason to pick up the shelves, but it was just something that we thought of doing right after. You were so confused and in a strange state that you were thinking purposefully that we have to pick up the shelves so there will be no evidence in that room. And you did that, didn't you? You were thinking clear enough to think, we better get those shelves because they might have our fingerprints on them. I don't... Sustain, rephrase the question, please. Mr. Menendez, were you thinking that you should pick up those shotgun shells because they might have your fingerprints on them. Uh, yeah, that's that. That's what was in my mind. I don't know how clear I was thinking, or how clear you have to think to, to do that. But it just went into my mind, and without even thinking about whether it was important or not, we just did it. Well, you made a conscious effort to pick up those shells, isn't that right? Yeah, we we made an effort to pick up the shells. You were thinking clear enough to think. We have to pick those shells up because they have our fingerprints on them, weren't you? I don't know how to answer that question. Yeah, I guess, yes. I mean, I wasn't thinking very clearly. I was shaking at the time, and I didn't think we picked up all the shells. I was surprised to read in the paper that we had, but uh, uh, that, uh, that was what we did. In fact, when you discussed it with your brother that you better pick up the shells because they had prints on them, you went back into the room, and you looked for every shell you could find, and you picked up every shell you could see, correct? It wasn't a discussion. I'm not sure which one of us said it. He, he, he believes that he said it. I, I may have been the one that said it. I don't remember. It was just something that someone said, so we just did. We weren't discussing things and then doing them. 
an idea came up and we just did it. Uh, at that point, we thought maybe we can get out of here <coughs> and maybe we won't go to jail. And, uh, and, and so we were just doing things that night on the spare of the moment. Now, isn't but it certainly true? picking up the shells was not a, uh, not a discussion like that. Isn't it true, sir, that you had a plan that the, the gunshots would uh, go off, that that would establish the time of the killings, and that you had a, an alibi for that time? Isn't that correct? You said that you were going to say that you were at the movies, that you would go to uh, see License to Kill, but, but uh, it was um, packed. You couldn't get in, so you would go to see Batman. Wasn't that part of the alibi here? Are, are you saying before? That was right. what we tried to do afterwards, and it didn't work out, but uh, because they wouldn't sell us tickets. Sir, isn't it true that your brother had discussed with Perry Berman that he and you would go to the movies. So he had told one of his friends that they would be at the movie. You would be at the movies prior to going to the Taste of L.A. Correct? Objection, Your Honor. Calls for hearsay and speculation. Well, it's also a compound question. If you want to break it down into this pretty new. Did you know, sir, that you and your brother had planned to go to the movies at eight o'clock that night? I didn't know that. Apparently, Lyle had plans to meet someone at the movies that we didn't show up for, but uh, I, did, I wasn't aware of that. You had no idea that you were going to go to the movies that night? Lyle, Lyle mentioned that he wanted to me to be back. When I went back to the house, either between 12 and 1, he mentioned that he wanted me back at a certain time because he said we might go to the movies or I might do something. I don't really remember what he said. I learned afterwards that uh, he actually was supposed to meet someone inside the movies that he was hoping the police wouldn't find out about. But uh, apparently that didn't work out either. The first time you ever found out about the movies was when? I'm not, I believe it was when I went back to the house between 12 and 1. I, I'm not certainly, I'm not specific about it though. So you found out that you were going to go to the movies between 12 and 1 when you returned to the house on Sunday? Yes, I believe and your so. your brother had told you to come back by 8 o'clock so that you could make the movie. Uh, Is that right? I, I believe that's what he said. I'm not certain it was for the movie, but I know he told me to get back at that time, so I'm really just speculating. You're aware that then you were covered for that period of time as to your whereabouts? We weren't covered. That's, that's what I'm trying to explain to you, that we, you we this, weren't sir. covered because a friend of mine was actually inside the movie that we were supposed to meet, and we didn't show up. Uh, it was certainly no plan before. You, you had both seen Batman before, correct? Yes. And you had both seen License to Kill before? I don't know if Lyle had, but I had. Okay. So if you had said that you were at Batman, and if someone asked you about Batman, you would be able to describe what occurred during that movie, correct? Yes, I, uh, I would have been able to say what the movie was about. I saw it. Okay. And after this Batman movie, there was this plan to go to the Santa Monica Civic Center to go to the Taste of L.A., correct? No. There was not that plan? No. You knew nothing about that plan? To go to the, to meet Perry at the Civic Center? Yes. Yes, but are you, are, when you refer to plan, are you referring to plan to kill my parents? That didn't happen. My, my brother, I'm not sure when I had the idea of going to the Taste of L.A. I know I had it when we asked my parents to go out that night that we were going to go over and meet Perry at the Taste of L.A. But uh, you're really, you're confusing me here. Sir, I, I thought you said that uh, you told your parents you were going to go to a, a movie, but you yeah. had no plans to go to a movie. Exactly. That you were really going to go to the Taste of L.A. Exactly. And now you're saying you didn't know you were, you were going to go to the Taste of L.A.? No, I knew at that point we were going to go to the Taste of L.A. We just wanted to be out of the house. We could have gone to, to the valley for all I cared. We just wanted to be out of the house. And since Perry was at the Taste of L.A., we uh, were planning on going over there. Now, this time period would have accounted for your whereabouts during the time that your parents were killed, correct? Objection, Dave, your Honor, is too much time period. Rephrase the question, please. Sir, there was a plan for you and your brother to say you were at the movies, correct? Afterwards, when we talked to the police? Yes. Yes. And that day, was there a plan to call your brother's friend to tell him 
you, were, you would be at the movies that day. Was there a plan? I don't, understand the, I don't understand that question. To call my brother's friend, to tell him we'd be at the movies, we didn't show up. All the police had to See, do was go and, and talk to him. Your friend, or your brother's friend, Perry Berman, spoke to your brother that day, didn't he? Objection on calls for hearsay, beyond his personal knowledge. Objection on the rule. I thought you were referring to the other friend, I, Perry Berman. Let's talk about Perry Berman for okay. a, a minute here. Did your brother tell you that he had a discussion with Perry Berman and he told Perry Berman that you and he were going to the movies that night and after the movies, you would meet him, Perry Berman, at the Taste of L.A.? I don't remember if he told me that. I know he testified that, he, that that's the conversation he had with Perry, but I don't know if I was aware of that at the time. When did you become aware of that? I know I was aware of that when I got back to the house and he told me about the conversation he had with Perry that day. And he was said... Was that at 12 o'clock? No, that was at 9.30. 9.30 at night? Yes. You had a discussion with him about the alibi at that time? No, he told me what he had talked about with my dad during the day. He talked about the Amitrage camp and that he was scared of my dad's reaction about it. He talked to me about the conversation he had with Perry. And, uh, and I guess at that point, he had made plans to meet Perry that night. I really am not clear on it, though. Now, you actually went, after the, the killings, after you picked up the shells, actually, when you were picking up the shells, did you testify that you turned on the lights at that point? Uh, yeah, the lights were a dimmer. So uh, I, I guess you turned the lights all the way up. They were low before. I think they were off. And you then turned them on? Uh, yes, one of us turned us on. Okay, when you say you think they were off, could they have been uh, a dim light? Dimmed all the way off. But uh, once it's all the way off, it clicks. Right. So I don't, but right before it clicks, the lights are all the way off. So you don't remember it clicking then? Well, I'm not the one that turned off the lights. Well, what, you turned them on? Uh, I don't know if I did or my brother did. I don't remember. But one of us did because the lights were on when we were picking up the shelves. When the light goes off on a dimmer, it clicks. And when it goes on, it clicks, correct? I believe so. And Judge, there are actually mistakes in All right, counsel, let's just confine ourselves to the legal objection. Right, objection overruled. Do you remember that, sir? Uh, remember what? Well, you were testifying about the dimmer, yes. and you just turn it. Yeah, what I'm saying is that either Lyle or I turn the lights all the way on, and it, it's a dimmer light. So we turned it all the way on to pick up the shells. So there was full light on? Yes. And uh, you saw the crime scene? Yes. And you saw your, your mother laying on the ground? I was actually trying not to look. I know she was there, but I, I didn't, I just wanted to, that luckily, the shells weren't in that direction. Luckily, the shells were against the wall, under the table, and around the hallway area. Did you see your brother go behind the sofa uh, to recover any shell casings? No. Shells? He, you did not see him do that? No. Were you watching what he was doing, or were you just picking up the shells that you were interested in picking up? I was just picking up the shells that I saw. I really wasn't watching what he was doing. Did you have to get on your hands and knees and crawl around to pick up the shell casings? Uh, I know one of the shells was underneath the, the table, uh, the eight side table in the back. Um, I got that, but I don't believe I had to get on my hands and knees and crawl around. How many did you recover? I have no idea. Do you know how many your brother recovered? No. With the uh, emptied uh, shells, what did you do with those shells? We put them in the car and eventually threw them out, uh, either that night or the next morning. Well, what did you do with them when you picked them up? We brought them to the car. Did you put them in your pocket first or what? I, I don't remember. Uh, we may have. I don't remember. Now, there was blood spattered on you, correct? Uh, there were teeny red dots on my jeans. On your jeans? Yes. Where else? That's all that I saw. <laughs> what color shirt were you wearing that day? I don't remember. Did you have a t-shirt on or did you have a sweater on, a jacket? 
I don't remember. I don't think I had a sweater, but I don't remember what I was wearing. Now, you saw these teeny red dots on your jeans. Yes. They're very obvious? No. Um, I, I saw them when I was... I guess I saw them when I was in the car. I don't really remember when I saw them, but I know that I had them on my jeans. And did you see your brother with the blood spatters on him? No, I didn't see anything on him. <coughs> yeah, he, he shot your father in the back of the head at close range, didn't he? Apparently. Um, the coroner testified it was a contact wound. Apparently. And he also went up to your mother and shot her in the face. It was a contact wound. Apparently. And you saw no blood spatters on him at all? I know he didn't change his clothes. Now, after you gathered up these uh, shells, what happened? We left. You simply say, OK, we have them all. Let's get out of here. Oh, we didn't believe we had them all uh, because we figured that the shells were all over the place, and I wasn't going near my parents at that point. I just wanted to get out of there. And Let me ask you this. Excuse me, could the witness be permitted yes. to finish his answer? Are you done? Finished? Uh, I don't even remember what I was saying. I, I don't remember. Okay. Your next question, please. Sir, you indicated that you were generally between the uh, coffee table and the television set, and that's where you did your firing from. Your Honor, this has been asked and answered. Yes. Correct? Yes. Now, why is it then that uh, there were some shell casings that you thought were by your parents? Objection or cause for speculation? Overall. Because I had no idea where the shells were. Uh, shells just apparently fly out of a shotgun. I, I don't know. I had no concern about where they were going or, or what was happening. I didn't know where they were. I thought they could be anywhere. You saw a number of uh, shotgun shells over to your right. Is that correct? As you were shooting, after you finished shooting, did you see the shotgun shells had been ejected to the right? Uh, I didn't see that after I finished shooting. When I went to pick up the shells, I, I noticed that most of them were, I don't have the diagram, but most of them were around the door uh, area. But you felt that you did not pick up all of the shell casings because you thought some were by your parents, correct? I couldn't imagine that I picked them all up because I figured they would have gone all over the room and I wasn't going all over the room. I thought maybe some were under the couch or different places, but I wasn't going to check. How would they have gotten under the couch? Objection calls for speculation. What I'm saying is I, I don't know. I don't know where they went. And, uh, and I just picked them up, the ones that I saw. I didn't care about any of the rest. How many did you pick up? I don't remember. you have any idea? Objection asked and answered. Overall. Uh, I, I really don't. I, I apparently picked up what my brother didn't. You remember picking up more than five? No. Less than five? No. I don't you have remember. No what idea. I, I have no idea. Once you picked up these uh, shells, did you look at your brother to, to see whether he had uh, completed his task of uh, picking up the remaining shells? I, I don't remember that. I just remember leaving. So as soon as you f finished picking up the shells that you had seen, you left the room? Yes. And you were in a hurry? At that point, I wanted to get out of the house. OK. At that point, you wanted to get rid of uh, the evidence? Yes. OK, so what did you do? Uh, we got in the car and, and, and left the driveway. And I believe we made a right. Uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Who was driving? My brother was. When you arrived at the car, were you the first one to the car? I don't remember. Do you remember opening, up, opening the trunk or the door to put your gun in? Uh, I believe the trunk was already open, but I, I really don't know. You don't remember? I, I know I did, but I don't remember how I did. You put your gun in the car? Yes. And uh, you're holding on to the shells? Uh, yes, yes. They in your hand? I, I just don't remember whether I had them in my pocket, in my hand, under my shoulder. I don't remember. At some point, you saw your brother in the car. What, did he look like he was in a hurry, too? We wanted to get out of there. Was there a discussion there? I, I don't remember a discussion there. I know that there was <coughs> some talk 
when we were driving uh, away on a different street, but at the house, I don't remember. Now, at the house, when you were picking up these shells, was there any discussion there? I don't remember. Don't remember at all? No. I don't remember any discussion. Was there ever any discussion once the lights went on that uh, let's make sure mom and dad are dead? Definitely not. You knew you didn't hear any moaning at that point, did you? I didn't hear anything at that point. No sounds? None. The moaning occurred before you ran out to get the extra um, cartridge to give to your brother, correct? Yes. Now, you indicated that your brother told you that your mother was trying to crawl? When He didn't tell me that that night. He told you that sometime later? Yes. Um, when was that? At some point, sometime later, uh, sometime, I don't, I don't know what time later. At some point, he did. Was it a day later? Like I said before, I, th I think we had a discussion or a talk when I first told him that I was, I was, I wanted, I didn't want to live anymore about some of the things that happened, but I don't know if we talked about that then or, or when. I just don't remember when. You did talk about that before you talked to Dr. Ozeal? Yes. So you knew about that before then, before yes. October 31st, mm -hmm. 1989? Is that yes? Yes. But there was no discussion, as you recall, inside of the house as the lights were turned on your parents were lying there, your father was seated and your mother was lying there. No discussion at all. There was talk before on the stairs, but once, once we had uh, gone in to pick up the shells, I don't remember any discussion. And then without any discussion, you left, you went to the car, and then your brother arrived there and you put the guns in the car, and there was no discussion there either? I don't remember. I don't remember. I know we got out of there in a hurry after that. Okay, so you were in a hurry, and your brother got into the car, started up the car, and took off. Yes. And where did you go? Like I said, I, I believe we made a ride. At, at some point, we headed toward uh, the uh, theaters. That's in Century City? Yes. Okay, why don't you describe what you did? What I did when? During that period of time. You're not going to object to talking should be more specific. Okay. You and your brother had gotten into your car. Yes. You had the guns that you killed your parents with in the car. You had the shells that had your fingerprints with you from the family room. And you started to drive away. And I'm going to object to the form of the question as assumed facts in the Overall. I don't know that the fingerprints uh, had my, uh, that the shells had my fingerprints on it. That was your concern, though, correct? It was, a, it was a guess. That's why we picked him up, yes. Okay. You have testified that your brother was driving the car. Yeah, he always drove. Did you discuss with him that you now had to go to the uh, Century City, uh, Century 14 theaters? I know one of us said, where are we going to go? Where are we going to say we were? This and that. And it may have been me that just said, let's head over to the movies. I'm really not sure. Okay. Now was, this, there was already a plan to go to the movies, isn't that right? No, there wasn't. Your brother had spoken to Perry Berman earlier that day and had said that you were going to the movies, sir. Isn't that right? Objection. Rephrase the question. Did you have any knowledge that your brother had discussed with his friend Perry Berman that you and he would go to the movies that night? Uh, apparently he was meeting a friend, Carrie Parker, at the movies, but right. I didn't, I didn't. I didn't know that. I didn't know about Carrie Parker till afterwards. So, when you got into the car and you suggested let's go to the movies, you just were lucky. Objection, Your Honor. Question sustained. Objection sustained to the form of the question. Why don't you ask a different question, please? Was it um, was it luck? that you happened to guess that uh, the movies would be the place that your brother had told uh, Perry Berman that you were going? N no, I, it, it, it wasn't lucky. It was, it was uh, luck that the police didn't talk to Carrie Parker, <laughs> but 
it wasn't luck that we headed toward the movies. We had at some point said, go to the movies. I don't remember if it was Lyle or me. It may have been Lyle thinking that Carrie was there. I don't remember is what I'm saying, but at some point we did head toward the movies. So you had no idea that your brother Lyle had set up this um, alibi about being at the movies with, with uh, Perry Berman. You had no knowledge of that, is that right? I don't think he set up an alibi with, with Perry Berman to, to be at the movies. Oh, the alibi was with the Taste of L.A. then? No, he told Perry, in my understanding of what he testified, that he was meeting a friend at the movies. Um, you don't recall him testifying that he was going to go with you to the movies? I guess, yeah, I guess so. That's why he told me to be home earlier. Now, at some point, you started to head to the Century 14 theaters, correct? Yes. Did you have to uh, give your brother directions? No. He knew where that was? Yes. And what happened when you arrived at the complex? Uh, we parked on one of the uh, side streets. It may have been in front of the theater. I don't really remember. And uh, we just ran over to the uh, ticket counter to get a ticket for uh, the movie. Now, your brother had testified that you had parked on a, a side street and there was metered parking there, correct? I don't remember metered parking. Um, but if he does, I don't remember it. You remember parking right in front of the uh, complex? No, I'm not sure. I'm, I, it, I think it was in front. It may have been on the side. I, I don't remember. Which street would that have been on? I have no idea. Well, where did you have to go from this metered parking to where the um, theater was? Uh, up the, uh, there's a stairs that go up to, to a, a level where the theater is right in front of it. I believe it's the stairs are right in front of some valet parking area or something like that. I'm, I'm not sure. So you didn't have to go very far? I don't think so. Do you remember your brother putting any money into the meter? I don't remember a meter. Do you remember your brother testifying that you parked at the metered parking? Asked and answered. He said something like that. I don't remember it. Um, I don't believe he said he put money in the meter because we didn't wait around for things like that. But you've forgot a, forgotten a lot of things, so if he testified that he, since he was driving, he parked at the meters, do you think that's correct? Objection, argumentative. Sustained. So you parked, you believe now, in the front of the complex? I'm not sure if it was in the front or on the side or where it was, but it, we parked next to the complex and we ran up to the, uh, to the ticket counter. That I specifically remember. Did you have to go up a couple of flight of stairs, flights of stairs? No, I, I believe there's just the uh, original flight of stairs in front of the parking area and the, that valet place. But at that point, we just ran over to the ticket counter. Now, your brother testified about uh, the um, metered parking about a couple of weeks ago. I have, I have, I guess, um, whenever he did it on cross or direct. Mr. Menendez, have you since learned that there are no meters there at the Century City uh, Shopping Center? Oh, I know there's no meters there now. Whether there were at the time, I have no idea. I don't remember a meter. So your brother does remember the meter, though, correct? Objection, Your Honor, to your brother remember. Sustained. So you go up and you go to the uh, uh, theater, and what happens? We don't go into the theater. We go to the ticket counter. OK, what happens there? Uh, I believe there's two people in line, I'm not quite sure, and he eventually asked for a, a, uh, a ticket to license to kill, and uh, that was a movie playing there. And you told him, I've seen that movie, I don't have to see that movie again? No, at that point we weren't planning on seeing a movie, we just needed to be at a place uh, at the time my, my parents had died. And I believe he told me later that the reason he originally didn't say he went to see Batman is because he thought his friend was in Batman and his friend would know he wasn't there. Uh, you have a good memory about certain things that he's testified and not so good about other things, is that right? Jackson, you want to argue that over? No, uh, I, don't know. I don't remember exactly what he testified on the stand. I'm talking about what he told me uh, later, uh, either that week or the next week um, after my parents died. That's what I'm talking about. So he discussed uh, the movie, but he didn't discuss what your parents were doing when he entered that uh, family room before you and your brother killed your parents. That was not important to you, was it? What they Objection, would... Your Honor, it's compound. 
it's argumentative as well. Okay. It's uh, noon, Your Honor. Does the court wish to take a break? All right, we'll take our recess until 1.30. Please don't discuss this matter with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about All right, are we ready otherwise to uh, begin the uh, afternoon session? Okay, then let's get both juries in. All right, everyone is present, and both jury panels as well, and you may continue your cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Mr. Menendez, you had indicated that your um, memory had been faulty regarding the actual time when you went into the room and you shot your parents. You remember that? I don't understand what you're saying. My that memory. you didn't remember the shooting? No, I didn't. Okay. You had testified that after you had uh, shot all of your ammunition that you went outside and that you gave one, um, one shell, one cartridge to your brother, correct? Yes. And all right, let's move on to some, some new area. And what you said was that you knew she was dying. The question is, how did you know that if you didn't know that you hit anything? I heard the noises as soon as I, and, and that's what just freaked me out. And just I just wanted to get out of the room. Uh, and that's how I knew. So you heard the noises as your parents were being shot? No, after. Afterwards, you heard the moaning. Yes. And that's how you knew that you had you had hit somebody. Well, I, I had assumed that I hit somebody, sir. I mean, I had fired so many rounds in that room that uh, I probably hit everything. You know, you um, were testifying about going to this uh, Century 14 Theater, correct? Yes. And that you uh, you parked, and you and your brother went upstairs. Uh, up, I guess it's an upstairs, if you call it. And you went to the um, box office? Yes. And who did the talking? My brother. And do you recall what he said? Uh, he had asked about uh, the movie License to Kill. And uh, I'm not sure if I recall what he said then or if he told me later. I'm, I'm confusing the two. I know what happened. You were right next to him at the time? <clears throat> yes, I was. Now, when you went there, were you trying to get tickets for the 10.30 showing? No, we were trying to get tickets for the 8 o'clock showing or somewhere around the 8 o'clock showing. And uh, what do you recall being told to you by the person at the ticket, uh, the uh, window? Overall. It wasn't told to me. It was told to my brother who was speaking, but I was right there. Uh, I don't remember exactly what she said, but in essence, that license to kill uh, was sold out and that uh, we couldn't get tickets for that movie. So this was after the movie was already over? It was near the ending. I didn't know what time it was. Um, I, I, my time was completely distorted at the time. If the movie uh, started about 8 o'clock, uh, what time was it that you arrived at the uh, Century 14 Theater? Uh, assuming that my parents died at 10 o'clock, then somewhere around 10, 10, 10, 15, right around there. Didn't, uh, didn't you testify that you waited around for the police to come? Yeah, we waited around. And you just sat around waiting for the police to arrest you? We, right? I sat on the, uh, the stairs. I figured that the police, there's roving patrol in Beverly Hills. I figured they'd be there in, gosh, uh, less than a minute, minute, two minutes, something like that. No recall, one showed up. Do you recall the, the, um, the neighbors coming in to testify about what time it was that they heard the uh, gunshots? Yeah. yeah. I checked the form of the question. Uh, it's improper. Overall. Yeah, that's why I assume it was around 10 o'clock, because that's what they said. Was it between 10 and 10.15 that you were shooting your parents? Uh, I, 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 my recollection is that I got home at like 9.30 and that it was probably before 10 o'clock, but if they say it was 10 o'clock, then I'm, then I'm off. And that it was, if it was after 10 o'clock? I, I, I didn't look at a clock. I didn't look at a watch. I don't know the exact time. At some point, though, you gathered up all this, uh, possibly incriminating evidence, and then you went to your car. Yes. Objection, Your Honor. Asked and answered. 
several times. Oh, really? Is that right? Yes. So, and how long did it take you to get to the theater? It's not far, maybe five, maybe ten minutes. And when you got there, are you saying that the movie was still going? That was my belief, yes. But you didn't know what time it was? No, I didn't know what time it was. So you didn't know whether that movie was over or not? I, I didn't know. Uh, well, I thought it was still going, but whether it was over or not, I wanted to get tickets for the 8 o'clock showing. And your brother asked for the 8 o'clock showing of License to Kill? Uh, I don't specifically remember the time of the showing, but it was around there for the License to Kill movie. And what was told to him? That it was sold out. And this is, at the end of the movie, they were willing to sell you tickets if they hadn't sold out? Inspection on calls for speculation. Sustained. After that information uh, was overheard by you, did, was there another request by your brother? Uh, yeah, he then asked for uh, the Batman tickets for the 8 o'clock showing or whatever time Batman started. And that was already over? I, I don't believe it was over. I, I thought she said something like, it's almost over, but they couldn't sell us tickets anyway. Uh, she wasn't able to sell us tickets for the 8 o'clock showing in Batman. So at that point, he just said, then fine, just give me the next uh, ticket for the next showing. So are you saying that you then had tickets after you killed your parents? You bought tickets for the movies? Yeah, we had tickets for the, I guess it was 10.15, 10.30, or 11 o'clock showing, whatever showing it was. So I remember looking at the tickets and seeing that there was a time on the tickets um, and that they were, uh, I obviously couldn't give those to the police. And the tickets were given to you by your brother? Yes. So you held on to the tickets? Uh, yes. And what did you do with those tickets? I had ripped them, and once I found out that they, uh, they were the wrong time, I just threw them out. When did you do that? When? Yes. I believe it was in the car. <clears throat> I believe it was in the car that I had checked the time. And you just threw them in your car? I don't know. I may have thrown them out the window. I really, uh, I don't remember. Now, isn't it true that uh, when you spoke to Detective Zoller on September 17th, 1989, you told Detective Zoller that you and your brother had gone to the movies at about 8 o'clock and your mother and father were seated, seated on the uh, couch in the den, the family room, watching television? I you remember telling him that? I don't remember it, but I probably did. That's what I wanted him to believe. And... Uh, at that point, at around 8 o'clock, did you actually go to the Century 14? At 8 o'clock? Yes. No, if I went at 8 o'clock, I would have had tickets. In fact, didn't you have tickets? If I had tickets, I would have given them to Detective Zoller. How would you have done that? When he asked me for the tickets, I would have handed it to him. Isn't it true, sir, that you threw your pants away after they were bloodstained and the tickets would have been in your pants, so you didn't have those tickets to give to anybody? No, that's not true. I did throw my pants away, but I had already thrown the tickets out the window or left them someplace in the car, so I didn't have the tickets in my pants at that time. Wasn't that the plan, sir, to go to the Century 14 to buy tickets so that you could say that you were at the movies and then when you had blood on your, your pants, you threw away those pants, and then you didn't have those tickets anymore. Are you saying that, that at eight o'clock, and I went to the theater at 8 o'clock, that I had gotten tickets, and I, by mistake, threw them away with my pants? No, not by mistake. You got blood on your pants, I believe you said. And yes. You threw your pants in a dumpster, correct? Yes. You had forgotten that you had your alibi tickets in your pants, didn't you? No. You didn't, you didn't forget about that? No, I did not. I didn't. You, you, you're saying that I, I threw away alibi tickets in a dumpster? No, I, I would. I would. You wouldn't have done that. That didn't happen. You wouldn't have done that? I probably wouldn't have done that if this was so planned out, but that didn't happen. I threw the tickets out the window afterwards. Did you know before you shot your parents that there would be so much blood that you would have to change your pants? No, I hadn't even thought about it. So you didn't think about maybe throwing away evidence? in the case when you threw your pants out. 
No. When you told Detective Zoller that you had left for the movies at 8 o'clock, were you lying to him? Yes. Now, do you remember what your parents were going to have for dinner on Sunday night, the 20th of August? I wasn't home. I have no idea. Didn't you tell Detective Zoller that your parents were supposed to order, they said they were going to order Chinese food. So, that's po so possibly that's where they wanted it. That is with, with respect to the phone that was next to, uh, I believe, your mother on the couch. <coughs> was that another lie? I lied to him many times. Uh, I don't remember saying that, but I might have. That's on the uh, September 17th statement that you gave to Detective Zoller in Cranberry, New Jersey, at page 17. You don't recall saying that? You don't recall saying that, sir? No. Would you have been able to make up something like that at the spur of the moment when you were questioned like that by uh, Detective Zoller? That they were in the process of, of eating Chinese food? No, you had said, when the question was asked of you by Detective Zoller about the phone that was on the couch found where your parents were killed, you said, and uh, they were supposed to order, they said they were going to order Chinese food, so possibly that's where they wanted it, meaning the phone, next to them. You mean to tell me that you just made that up at the spur of the moment? Objection, argumentative. Overall. I must have. This was at 10 o'clock at night. I don't know why I would have said they were ordering Chinese food. Uh, I have no idea what they, what they ate for dinner that night. It, you... it might have been in the pictures in the kitchen. I don't know. Um, but... I have no idea. Well, why did I'm you confused at the question. Why did you say that on September 17th? Maybe if you'd show me where I said it, I'd be able to tell you why or how. Can you approach, Your Honor? Yes. Page 17. Line 7 through 9. I, I would need the page before to be able to tell you what context the, uh, it happened in. Did you see the question before? Yeah, we were talking about the, uh, apparently we were talking about the phone, but I don't have the page before, so I can't tell you. Yeah, I'm saying I don't know why the phone was there. Why I said they were eating Chinese food, I just made it up. Uh, the whole conversation was about why the phone was underneath the pillow. And I was telling him, I don't know why the phone's underneath the pillow. And at that point, I, uh, I stuttered over here and I said, maybe they were eating Chinese food. No. I believe you said, and uh, they were supposed to order, they said they were going to order Chinese food. Right, that's exactly what I said. I said a lot of things in that conversation. I, I don't know. We had a long conversation about why the phone was behind the pillow. I really don't know. And so when you said that, you just made up a lie right at the spur of the moment. Apparently, I just made up a lie. I mean, did they order Chinese food? I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what happened. You were home that day, and they told you that they were going to have Chinese food for dinner, apparently, that's no, according to your statement. Definitely. Well, that's what I told them, yes. I told them I was home all day. Why would you lie about that? 
because I didn't want him to know what was going on that weekend. If he knew what was going on that weekend, it would have been pretty obvious who did this. And that was not my point of having that conversation with Detective Zola. So to say that you were home and your parents said that they were going to have Chinese food and then we went out to the movies, that would somehow disclose everything that you had in your mind? You're completely misstating what happened in that conversation. Completely misstating it. The statement is there's a question to you about the phone and you say, well, my parents had said that night that they were going to order Chinese food. Maybe that's why the phone was there. No, right. what you're leaving out is that for two pages before that, I was telling him I didn't know why the phone was left behind the pillow. It could have fell there by accident. And then finally, I come up with they were going to order Chinese food. That's exactly what happened. So that was a lie. You say they were eating strawberries and and I didn't and, say anything, sir. And, and cream. I have no idea what they were going to do that night, sir. Yet you tell Detective Zoller that your parents told you that they were going to order Chinese food that night. Yes. And that was a lie? Yes, it was. Why did you do that? He was trying to find out why the phone was behind the pillow. And he kept asking me why the phone was behind the pillow. And I was saying, I didn't know. Apparently, that's what it says in the conversation. So finally, I said, they were going to order Chinese food. You said they told you they were going to order Chinese food. Yes. Right? So that means that you were there that day, apparently. That's what I was trying to portray to Detective Zoller, yes. That you were there that day. I, I even told Detective Zoller that they were home watching a tennis match during the day. And that's what they were doing? Yes, that's what my brother told me they were doing. I don't know where I got the statement from. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Whether I just made it up, whether my brother told it to me, I don't know. Are you saying that that's something that you didn't know? Well, apparently they weren't ordering Chinese food, so I was wrong. Is that right? I don't know what your parents were doing. All right, I'm going to object to you. All right, let's not uh, have uh, questions asked by the witness or retorts by the uh, prosecution. Ask your next question, please. It's your testimony that uh, you were gone that whole day, correct? I was gone the entire day. So you wouldn't have known, you wouldn't have spoken to your parents, so you wouldn't have known what they were going to have for dinner. Fair to say? Uh, fair to say that they did not have Chinese food for dinner. How do you know that? Because, overall, because there's no Chinese food in the kitchen. So they didn't have Chinese for dinner. You're saying that they had blueberries for dessert. There was no Chinese food in the kitchen. I made it up. They weren't ordering Chinese food at 10 o'clock at night. Did you check the kitchen that night to see if there was Chinese food there? No, but I looked over the photos afterwards. Could they have thrown away the, the containers? Objection. Our calls for speculation. You don't know what they, they had that night then, do you? Since you weren't there. If my memory is correct, there was a Domino's pizza box in the kitchen. That's, that's my vague memory of what I saw in the pictures. But I don't know what they had for dinner because I wasn't there. We're going to go on to the um, October 31st, 1989 session that you had with Dr. Ozeal. Now, with regard to that uh, meeting that you had with Dr. Ozeal in October, the end of October, about a week prior to that, had you spoken to Detective Zoller on October 24th, 1989 in Beverly Hills? I spoke to him at some time in October, yes. And did uh, Detective Zoller um, inform you that there would be a LA Times article about the killings of your parents? I don't remember. We discussed a lot in that conversation. And was it discussed? I'm going to object to this. Um, All right. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Mr. Menendez. Directing your attention to October 31st of 1989, you uh, came into town to uh, have a session with Dr. Ozeal, is that correct? Objection to state's testimony. Overall. No. 
Where were you on that day? On our tour. I'm going to catch this line of questioning based on our discussion at the sidebar just now. Until well, this is an appropriate area of cross-examination. Where was I on October 31st? Yes. I was at Dr. Ozeal's office. Had you been in town that day? I believe so. Uh, I mean, I thought I was in town the whole ending of October. Now, you went in to see uh, Dr. Ozeal after having called him up to make an appointment? Uh, I called up his secretary. Okay. And was that a day or two in advance? I believed it was the day before. And you arrived at his office. And you had been there before, correct? Yes. In fact, um, did you have a pretty good relationship with Dr. Ozeal? Objection 1016. I, have, I hadn't seen him in uh, many, many, many months other than at the memorial service. But um, what was your relationship with what, what was your opinion of him at that point? Objection, Your Honor. Overall. Your Honor, I'd like to be on this area, please. It's not necessary. Overall. My opinion of him? Yes. Uh, he, was, uh, he was an easy guy to talk to about certain issues. And so on that day, October 31st, you went in to see Dr. Ozeal. Yes. And what did you tell him initially? Just how I was feeling lost and uh, how depressed I was and how I didn't know where my life was going anymore and that I, I thought I might try out tennis for a while and, and that's what I would planned to do. Um, and that I, I really wasn't sure how long I'd be living. And were his notes correct? You said that you reviewed his notes. Were his notes correct about why you had come in and what you had said uh, initially? No, I, I don't believe so. Um, certain things stand out to me in his notes. The beginning uh, doesn't. I, th I think that's what he said, though. I'm not sure. Well, that, in fact, was what happened. Is that right? Yes. And after telling him that you were depressed, did you ask him to leave uh, the office so that you could talk to him, go for a walk? Uh, after he wasn't getting why I was depressed, I then decided to tell him. You, you had not told him up to that point that you and your brother had killed your parents? No, I hadn't. Did you specifically request that you leave the office for a walk? Yes, I did. And when you took this walk, uh, was there a point at which you decided that you were going to tell Dr. Ozeal that you and your brother had killed your parents? Uh, yeah, I was struggling with it um, the entire walk. I walked up to, um, to uh, my church. I walked to this, this store on, on Santa Monica. And I was telling him about things that I wanted to do, like uh, write a book about my dad. And uh, I was trying to work up the courage to tell him. Uh, it was not an easy thing to say. Did you tell him that you had depression and that you had dreams and you had vivid pictures of your parents being murdered? Uh, when? Before or after I told him I killed my parents? At any time? I could only have said that afterwards. So you were having vivid pictures of your parents being murdered, you told him? I, if, I, if he says I told him that, I, I don't know. I don't uh, have vivid pictures of my parents being murdered. Now, on October 31st, 1989, were you having vivid pictures of your parents being murdered? I was having vivid, vivid pictures of me shooting in the fire and uh, the horrible scene afterwards. And that's what was giving me the, uh, the nightmares. Well, these nightmares, was it because you saw the fire of your gun, or was it because you saw your mother's face and your father's face as you were shooting at them? No, you couldn't see faces in the room that dark. Uh, it was basically because of what I saw after I went back before the 911 call. You took a walk with uh, Dr. Ozeal. 
Yes. And you walked into a park? Uh, yeah, it's the church area, um, the Church of Good Shepherd. And at, at one point, you turned to him and you said, we did it. And that was later back by his office. Sometime after you had taken the walk? Yes. You told doc Dr. Ozeal, we did it. I don't know if I used those exact words, but I told him that we did it, yes. Now, did he, did he ask you to um, describe what happened there, or did you go back up to his office? No, at that point, he started saying that he thought I was going to tell him that, and that he had expected that. And I, I was trying to talk more about then why I was suicidal and hoping he would be able to help me out, and telling him about my dreams and how I felt guilty for certain things. And uh, it wasn't until after that we started talking about the details. But we were talking about that up on the way to his office. So when you told him that you and your brother had killed your parents, you started to talk about uh, the events leading up to the actual killing. Uh, no, the first thing I told him, uh, he asked me what happened, and I told him that Lala and I ran in the room with two shotguns. That's the first thing you said to him? Yes. And what exactly did you tell him? I told him that, that and I told him uh, I, I told him everything that happened afterwards. Um, I was crying at the time and pretty hysterical, and he was trying to calm me down. And I was just blurting out everything that we did afterwards. Now, you were pretty depressed. And that's why you went to see him, correct? Yes. You wanted to get this off of your chest, that you had killed, you and your brother had killed your parents. No. You didn't want to get that off your chest? I did want to get it off my chest, but... Uh, that's not why I went to see him. I hadn't planned on telling him. But once you started to tell him, it started to flow out of you, correct? You started to feel better about telling somebody what you did. Once I started to tell him, I mean, after I had, after I had told him downstairs that we did it? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, told him, uh, I told him what happened. And you told him why you did it? Uh, no, that wasn't, that, that didn't come up next. The, he just wanted to know, he was asking a lot of questions. He was asking me where we got the guns. Uh, he was asking me what happened then and what happened there. And he, just, he wanted to know more and more and more. And, uh, and then he started asking who knew what and what did the police know and so on. Do you remember his note stating that uh, after you told him that we did it, you walked into the office and began to reveal in elaborate detail all the events leading up to and following the actual murder of your parents. Do you remember those um, notes that he had? And that's what his uh, notes apparently say. Obviously, that's not true. And uh, why is that so obvious? It's it's obvious because he says that in his notes, but he doesn't give the details that he says I gave him. Now he says in his notes. And these notes were done shortly after these two sessions he testified, correct? Objection, Your Honor. Calls for speculation. Sustain. Objection, sustain. Do you recall, sir, the notes indicating that you... I think object to this as hearsay as to our client. I would object to the use of the notes as well, Your Honor, versus what the witnesses testified to. The witnesses, yeah. Overall. Mr. Menendez, you've indicated... I'm going to object your honor to the use of the notes based on prior 402 rules of this court. Mr. Menendez, you indicated that you read the notes, correct? Yes, I did. And those notes indicated that uh, you specifically said that you had watched a television show which dealt with the son murdering a father, correct? Um, does it use that exact language? Yes. All right, uh, yeah, that's what he says I said in the notes and that you and your brother, Lyle, had begun to talk about how similar your father was to the father presented in the television show. Do you remember that? Yes, that I believe he also says that in the notes. He indicated that uh, you told him that Lyle had not seen the entire program, but only the last portion of the show, correct? Uh, if he indicates that, then that's what he indicates. 
and that you told Dr. Ozeal that the conversation about killing your father was casual at first with you and your brother asking each other what it would be like if perhaps the controlling influence in your life that dominated you had in his mind, in your mind, trapped you, made you feel inadequate, and prevented you from doing what you wanted to do was simply not there anymore. You and your brother discussed that, didn't you? Yeah, that's... That uh, particular line uh, struck me as uh, uh, odd because he said we, we talked about it in a casual way as if that's what people would do. Um, but that's also what he says in his notes. And that you and your brother tossed back and forth the notion of how, you, how your lives wouldn't be worth living if your father continued to exist. Yes, uh, he says all of that and a lot more in his notes. And you weren't sure whether you would want to continue living uh, without your father out of your life, correct? I believe so, if that's what you're reading from his notes. Now, you indicated that your father, and this is, I'm not going to go on the statement right now, but you've testified that your father was very controlling, that he wanted to tell you what school to go to, is that right? Yes. Objection, Your Honor, asked an answer this morning. Overall that he was going to um, decide upon your career, Ask correct? Uh, yeah, Mr. Kuriyama, how this came up in the conversation is this is exactly what Dr. Ozeal knew from talking to my father and from dealing with him. And the only things that he mentions in those notes are exactly what he knows about my father, because that's what he was telling Mr. me. Mr. Menendez, did your father tell Dr. Ozeal <coughs> that you and your brother had watched this movie on the Billionaire Boys Club and you decided to kill him based on that movie? Objection. Did you? Objection. 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 No, I'm not referring to that. I'm referring to how he described my father is exactly the image that he had of my father. And that's exactly how you've testified here about your father controlling your life and telling you what to do, correct? No, I... Uh, I said here a lot more things that my father did to me than just control me. That is for sure. And, and in fact, uh, Dr. Ozeal doesn't. I don't think that the yes, you make. And Dr. Ozeal doesn't testify to any of that. He, if he thinks that uh, I killed my dad because he was controlling, which is what he thought, and what I led him to believe, because I wasn't going to tell him why, that's exactly right, and that's exactly what's in his notes, and so he says it over and over again. So what you told him that day is what he put down in his notes. No, that's what we discussed. Okay. So this whole discussion that you had about the Billionaire Boys Club was bogus, is that right? No, it wasn't bogus. It didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about my dad being controlling and dominating, as he puts it, that we talked about, and that we talked about on the second, too. And in fact, uh, you were getting tired of that, weren't you? Excuse me? When you was getting, I? You were getting tired of your father telling you what to do, and. Uh, telling you uh, where you were going to live, what your career would be. You got tired of that. You are now a man. You are now 18 years old, and you were tired of that, weren't you, sir? No, I was tired of the sex. Him telling me what to do had happened all of my life, and I expected it to go on for the rest of my life. It was the other part that I was tired of. Now, you remember testifying that your father in September of 1988 had threatened to disinherit you, correct? In... September, you, I believe you testified September of 1988. No, he didn't threaten to do that. He did not? No, he told me that I was. He didn't threaten to do that. And you also testified that I believe you said in May of 1989, your mother told you that your father wanted to disown you. Yes. And you felt that that meant that you would be completely cut off from the family and you did not want that, did you? No, that's not at all what I thought. I knew that he wouldn't cut me off from the family. Uh, my relationship with my dad was not one that he was just going to end and kick me out of the house. There was no way he was going to do that. And that's why it scared me when my mom said that my dad was going to disown me because I wasn't telling him enough details of my tennis. It frightened me because I didn't know what, what that meant. In May of 1989, you told your father, I'm not going to tell you what I did with my tennis practice. I'm a man now. I'm an adult. I'm not telling you anything else. Isn't that true? <coughs> no, I would never say that to my dad. 
Isn't that your testimony that, that you told your father you weren't going to tell him uh, your every move uh, in a particular day and that's why your father decided to disown you? No, if I would have told my father that, he wouldn't have disowned me. He would have beat the hell out of me. That's not something you tell my dad. What I was doing was just not telling him what I was doing. And when he was asking me detailed questions about my tennis, I was trying to be evasive. and I was just saying I was fine. I was trying to keep it private. I wanted to keep some things secret from him. But I certainly didn't tell my dad that. What, what else did you want to keep secret from your father? I wanted to keep secret from my father different girlfriends that I had had. I wanted to keep secret from my father everything. When you say everything, what do you mean? I just didn't want uh, the intrusiveness uh, in my life. He would tell me what to do, and that's fine. But in terms of exactly what I was doing on every particular day, I didn't feel like I had any privacy. I didn't feel like I had any, I, I knew who I was. And because of that, you were, you were getting tired of your father, weren't you? I was getting tired of a certain part of our relationship, which I desperately wanted to end when I went to college. But him controlling me and telling me what to do happened since I was born. Uh, that was normal. And now that you were a man, you're almost 19 years old, you didn't want that anymore. Want which You didn't part? want your dad telling you what to do anymore. I thought he would have less control over what I did every day when I went to college. But uh, no, I, I expected him to tell me what college I went to and what I was going to do afterwards. I had always expected to go into business with my dad and that sort of thing. In fact, you testified that your mother wanted you to go to UC Berkeley, correct? Yes, she did. And isn't it true that your father wanted you to go away too and go to UC Berkeley? No, my mom wanted me to go to UC Berkeley and my dad would not hear of it. I was staying as close as possible to him. Sir, do you recall uh, a young man by the name of Ed Fennell who lived uh, with your family in the summer of 1989? Yes, Ed was a friend of mine. And do you remember Ed Fennell being there when you got your acceptance letter to UC Berkeley? He wasn't right there. I remember walking in the door uh, from the mailbox, opening up UC Berkeley, astonished that I had been accepted, and I immediately called my mom because I was, I was ecstatic. And, uh, and she was <coughs> real happy as well. Do you remember your father wanting you to go to UC Berkeley? And that you didn't want to leave home. You wanted to stay around. You wanted to go to UCLA, correct? No, definitely not. So if he had heard your father tell you, UC Berkeley is the best school, go there, would Ed Fennell be lying? Objection, Your Honor. Calls for hearsay. That calls for multiple hearsay and calls for uh, conclusion by the witness. Overall. Uh, no. Overall. Is that right, sir? Uh, no, I, I, Ed's, uh, Ed's a nice person. Um, I doubt, uh, I, I'm sure my dad was happy that I got accepted into UC Berkeley, but uh, my dad had always told me that if I got into UCLA, that's where I was going. Um, and that's what happened. Isn't it true? And in this conversation, you said you didn't want to go to, Ber you didn't want to go to UC Berkeley, you wanted to stay in LA. Now I'm going to object to the question today in what conversation and also yes, can, you the, can you specify which conversation yes, you're right. talking about? The day that you got this acceptance letter to UC Berkeley and Ed Fenno was there at your house and heard your father tell you to go to UC Berkeley. You recall that day? Objection or the form of the question, since <laughs> that's not in evidence. And Rephrase the, the question, evidence. please. Okay. Do you recall Ed Fenno being at your house in the summer of 1989? Asked and answered. In the summer of 1989, no, I don't. When do you recall him being there? Uh, in November and December of 1988. When is it that you got this acceptance letter to UC Berkeley? If he says he was there, then I guess during that time. I didn't think I got the acceptance letter until February. It's, so Ed Fennell stayed at your house for an extended period of time, for a period of months? I think it was two months. I, I don't remember the exact time. At some point, you do recall him living with you? Yes. And do you recall your father on the day that you got this acceptance letter telling you that that was the best school you got into and urging you to leave home and go to UC Berkeley? Uh, definitely not. But he had said that that was the best school that I had gotten into. And uh, he was definitely happy that I got into a, a campus like UC Berkeley. But the real school that I wanted to go to was Brown. And my dad would not let me go there. Did 
was Ed Fenno there when you told your father you didn't want to go away to school at Berkeley, you wanted to stay in Los Angeles? I hadn't been accepted to UCLA at the time, and there was no school in Los Angeles for me to go to. I don't remember the conversation that you're talking about, though, to be perfectly honest. You've seen the reports? No, I haven't seen those reports of Ed's. Now, your mother told you she wanted you to leave to Berkeley, correct? Uh, yes. And your father was very proud of you for having uh, been accepted into UC Berkeley? Uh, yes, he was. And you've testified that you like to spend a lot of time at, in Westwood. Whenever you wanted to be by yourself, you wanted to have lunch, you'd go to Westwood. You liked L.A., didn't you? Uh, I, I liked, I went to Westwood a lot with uh, the tennis team. Um, that was a really a hangout place uh, for a lot of kids. Now, over, but I, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, you can put your answer. Uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a place that I, <coughs> I knew every uh, every part of, and uh, but I remember. Well, it doesn't matter. Go on. You felt very comfortable at the UCLA campus, didn't you? I had never walked around the UCLA campus. I mean, before I was accepted into UCLA, I uh, I didn't know much about the campus at all. You you spent a lot of time in Westwood, is that right? When you moved here. Yes. Uh, once I moved to Beverly Hills, I did. Okay, and you moved to Beverly Hills before you got accepted into UCLA? Yes. So you would go to UCLA before you got accepted into UCLA? Objection on a Westwood and UCLA are not exactly the same. Objection over a Westwood, a Westwood and UCLA, a Westwood's a city, UCLA is a school. Uh, Westwood borders on UCLA. But there's nothing to do in UCLA if you're not going to UCLA, so. Did you like the area of Westwood, which is right next to UCLA? Certainly. And you spend a lot of time there? Sustained. Now, isn't it true that you said that you wanted to stay in LA to go to school? Overall. Uh, no, I said that I had not been accepted into any campus in UCLA. My dad. I mean, at, in L.A. My dad had told me from, gosh, it was still when Ed was living there, uh, it must have been November or December, that he knew a man who was going to basically get me into UCLA uh, and that that's where he wanted me to go. Now, do you recall, we're going to get back to the Dr. Ozeal statement. <clears throat> do you recall that uh, you told Dr. Ozeal that you didn't know if you would want to continue living uh, unless your father was out of your life? No, that's not what I said to Dr. Ozeal. That's not true? No, it isn't. That's what he said to me, though. In fact, you were afraid in May of 1989, when you were rebelling against your father, that he was going to cut you off. He was going to cut you off totally. Correct? Rebelling against my father? Yes. You don't rebel against my father. You do what my father says. You do it the way he says. You do it the way he wants. There is no rebelling. There's rebelling in the sense of not telling him everything. But if he finds out about it and he asks about it, you do what he says. Uh, I never rebelled against him. So if you didn't do what he said, he would disown you? Yeah, and I, I wasn't sure. I mean, he never said that to me. Your mother told you that? That's what my mom told me uh, on a phone in Dr. Ozeal's office. And I, I was very scared about that. I did not know what disowning meant, because it certainly didn't mean kicking me out of the house. So I, I was sort of worried about that. Now, that, that's what disown means. I mean, were you afraid to just get kicked out of the house so you wouldn't have what, everything that you had growing up all the tennis lessons, uh, the car, and everything that you got. Were you afraid that you would lose that when your dad, when your mother told you that your father was going to disown you and cut you off from them? Okay, I'm going to reject the question. Actually, it's the first part when Mr. Brown Right, was excluding saying. the first part where there was a definition of the word disown. Do you understand the question? The question then is, was I afraid of being disowned? Yes. No, I was never going to be cut off from my parents in terms of their wealth. They had tons of money. And uh, I, w I really would have loved to go on the way to a boarding school. That would have been a dream. But uh, being 
kicked out of the house, that wasn't going to happen. So when you testified in front of these two juries that you thought you were disinherited, you knew that wasn't true. Oh, you I was, said you'd never get cut off from their wealth. Is that right? While they were alive, of course, they were going to make sure their sons had everything and looked best in society. Uh, I was disinherited. I was out of the will. But uh, obviously they were going to keep sending me to school and paying for school and paying for my cars and paying for my clothes and my tennis and everything. That's what you assumed? Well, that's what was going to happen. How, did, how, how do you make that statement that you know that's what was going to happen? Well, if I had never told my brother what was happening between my dad and I, I would have gone on to UCLA and it would have continued throughout UCLA and assuming I had lived and, uh, and hadn't decided to just end it, it, it would have gone on. My, this was, this, it had all, my, they'd always given me everything my entire life in terms of financial uh, stuff. You had been well taken care of all your life and so when your father, through your mother, said that he was going to disown you, you were worried about that, weren't you? I was not well taken care of my entire life. I had every dime I ever wanted, though, um, that's for sure. But uh, I was definitely worried when she said she was gonna, they were going to disown me. I didn't think for a moment they were going to kick me out on the street. Uh, that, that wasn't going to happen. They weren't going to be able to explain that t to their relatives and to their friends. That simply wasn't going to happen in their social status and the image that they wanted to portray about this family. I, uh, and that's why I was concerned about what she meant by disown. Now, you were hoping that they wouldn't kick you out. You were an adult. They could have just said, okay, you're on your own now. That would Correct? have been great. Uh, excuse me, Your Honor, but I don't think that was the question. I did read it. All right, uh, just state your objection. All right, so objection sustained. Rephrase the question, please. Isn't it true, sir, that uh, your parents, you are now an adult, your parents could have just cut you off? as your mother had told you your father intended? They could not have done that. Okay. Now, do you recall telling Dr. Ozeal, back to the October 31st, 1989 statement, do you recall telling Dr. Ozeal that after watching this uh, movie on the BBC, that you and Lyle had the discussion about your father being similar to the father depicted in the BBC movie, and that you turned to each other and you were trying to, s to decide whether or not you would make the clear decision to engage in murder, correct? Objection. No. Huh? Objection. No, that uh, never took place and it was certainly never said in that session. Uh, you recall in Dr. Ozeal's notes that he said that you told him that it had to be soon and could not be delayed that Lyle wanted to wait to plan it out more thoroughly. Do you remember that? You can object to that hearsay and confrontation grounds as to Lyle Menendez? Overall. Uh, Do you remember excuse that me, statement? Uh, that statement? Yes. I'm not sure if I remember reading that. If it's in there, then uh, that's what he wrote in there. And that you told Dr. Ozeal. So are you asking whether he made this statement to Dr. Ozeal? Is that what your question yes, is? Yes, Your Honor. Well, let's phrase it that way. Okay. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that? No. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal, this is the next line, that you and your brother drove to San Diego, obtained false identification, and purchased two shotguns with false identification, and then you drove back to Los Angeles? Do you remember telling Dr. Ozeal that? I told him that. Uh, I told him part of that much earlier in the conversation when he asked me why we hadn't been arrested by the police if Lau and I had bought shotguns. And, uh, and I told him that we had used my brother's friend's ID, and that's probably, what, that's probably why we hadn't. But uh, him and I did talk back and forth about then how long it would be until they traced my brother's friend's ID. Mr. That's Menendez. when we had that conversation. But I certainly never said that I obtained identification down there. Uh, that, that I didn't say. That wasn't true. You used false identification. Yeah, that's not what he says. Did he guess that you had gone to San Diego, or did you tell him that? I told him that. Okay. Now, did you also tell him that you drove back to Los Angeles and you had an alibi in the form of a wine and cheese tasting party? When in the conversation are you asking? 
I told them I told them that we had gone to the movies. I told them that, that we dropped off the guns. I told them about the, the wine tasting thing I, uh, or the taste of L.A. I told them all of that, what we did afterwards. Did you tell Dr. Elzeal that shortly before the party <coughs> began, you surprised your parents in the room in which your parents were found murdered? Did you tell them that? Uh, I would not have told them that, because uh, that, that isn't true. You had testified earlier that you may have said, you may have said that you used the word surprised. Objection on mistakes for testimony. Overall. No, that's not what I'm referring to isn't true. My parents died uh, apparently right when the wine tasting uh, thing was ending, not when it was beginning. So he's wrong about that. Well, okay, so he's wrong about whether it was before or after the wine tasting. He got a lot of things garbled. I told him it so quickly um, that... Let's then focus on the other part of that statement, sir. That you surprised your parents in the room that, you, that your parents were murdered in. Well, I'm going to object and cite the court to page 16270 of the transcript. Excuse me, 17? No, it's 16270. Overall, this is you may answer, proper cross-examination. Uh, that I surprised them? I said we ran in on them. I don't believe I used the word surprise. You testified earlier that you may have, correct? Objection on this state. The testimony of page 16270. Rephrase the question, please. Did you ever say that you went in and surprised your parents? I, uh, I don't remember saying that. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that you walked in first and shot your father? No, I said I walked in first, but uh, I didn't say who shot who. And did you tell Dr. Ozeal that your brother followed you to finish off the job? Uh, are you asking what I told Dr. Ozeal and he says I said in the notes? Because what he testified to was, was different from what, what he said in those notes. Uh, and uh, so which one are you referring to? Did you say that? That I surprised my father? Did you say, we've already gone by that one, did you say that you went into the room first shooting your father? I said that I went into the room and I just started shooting. So he didn't make that up? He made up the shooting the father part, but not the other part. In fact, you have testified here, you don't know who you shot. And that's what I told him. So you told him you entered first, and you started shooting, you don't know who you shot, and your brother followed behind you, and he shot at whoever he shot at. Yes. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that the intention was that your mother had to be killed because she would be a witness and because she would be miserable and probably suicidal without your father anyway? Did the, you tell him that? The, the second part uh, he had talked about, but the part about being a witness, and I believe he also said somewhere in there that we could not have killed our father without killing our mother and that it wouldn't have been possible or something like that uh, was never discussed and doesn't make any sense. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that your mother would be a link to your having, you and your brother, you and your brother having committed the murder? No. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that as you entered with your pump shotgun, your father cried out, no, no, no? I don't believe I ever used the word pump shotgun. And I said that my, uh, my dad yelled out. My dad never cried out anything in his entire life. Uh, he just didn't cry out. Okay. Um, so I wouldn't have told him that either. All right, so what you want to do is say that you didn't say pump shotgun, you simply said shotgun. Well, you keep using the word pump shotgun, but I don't refer to guns that way. Okay, this is what the notes say, the pump shotgun. So you're saying you didn't say pump shotgun? No. Is that correct? Page four.
you um, are quarreling with the use of pump shotgun. Did you simply say you entered with your shotgun? Probably. Okay. And that you recalled your fa father yelling out no, 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 rather than crying out no, no, no? He says crying out no, okay. no, no, and right. uh, that simply uh, could not have happened. What did you tell him then? I told him that my dad yelled no uh, while we were firing. And do you recall telling Dr. Ozeal that your father died first? Uh, no, I, I don't recall telling him that. I'm sure he could have assumed that, though. How would he assume that? Uh, if my mother was still making a noise and my dad wasn't, um, then he would have assumed that. Would you have told him that, maybe? Maybe. I now, the next line, the mother your mother was moaning and did not die immediately. Did Dr. Ozeal make that up? Council, let's not argue. If you want to approach, you can do that. Not present. All participants in the trial are present. Do council wish to discuss anything before the jury comes in? Detective Zoller went downstairs to see if jurors were present, and I believe he saw some jurors looking at. Yes, they were reading the sign. Reading the sign. So um, I didn't personally view them, but maybe the court needs to inquire. So oh. I, I think it was referring to the court. And it was not referring to the court. It was referring to uh, individuals by name. Um, did, as far as I understand it, anyway, uh, do uh, other parties wish to be heard? Well, our concern, Your Honor, is that our jurors, if they've read uh, these signs, will take it that uh, that person is somehow connected with this case. And in fact, I, not knowing the situation, when I saw the sign, assumed it was a female supporter of the Menendez brothers who, unconnected to us, was, for whatever reason in her own mind, staging a protest relating to this case. That, in fact, is not the case. But I'm concerned that our jurors will see that and somehow make a connection which is not there. And um, it would be our suggestion to the court that the court dispel uh, the notion that that <coughs> one is in any way, shape, or form connected with this case. Okay, did anyone else want to be heard? Anything to say? I didn't see it. All I know is that there is a, a, a little group okay. of uh, smoking jurors from both juries that are always out on the front apron of the court. The bailiff uh, informed me that there were some jurors out there, um, whether they're smokers or otherwise, I don't know. Um, all right, we will uh, make inquiry then for the purpose of um, finding out uh, if um, any of the jurors have seen this and uh, will it uh, influence them in any way. Um, the only uh, question I have is as to whether counsel have any suggestions as to whether that inquiry should be done of the jurors one at a time or as a group. Um, do you have any preference in that regard? I think we ought to bring them out and find out who saw it. So, or do you want to just interview all 35? I think you should bring them in individually, or else you're going to tell the others things they don't really know. Well, it could very well be that there has been some communication um, by jurors, since this really is not something that uh, is um, directly related to the case, and they might not feel there's any constraints to them in discussing it. Um, it would be very time consuming to um, do it uh, one at a time. Um, what I'll do is have um, one jury panel at a time come in and then I'll inquire of them whether they have been out during the recess or have heard of any activities out there during the recess. And those that have, we will make further inquiry and deal with it that way. So let's first deal with the uh, blue jury since they are uh, closest at hand and have them come into the jury box and we'll inquire of them. All right, the uh, blue jury is in the courtroom and uh, before we proceed with the testimony, I just want to uh, discuss some matters with you. Um, during the recess, some of you uh, might have been outside the courthouse and uh, been towards the front of the courthouse and um, let me ask, first of all, were any of you outside in front of the courthouse? 
Okay, we got one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, <laughs> quite a few. All right, and did any of uh, you have occasion to see anybody um, carrying signs or distributing things out there? Um, okay. I assume that you did read those signs, whatever they said. I haven't seen them, but they've been reported to me. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Regardless of uh, what the, the specific language of those uh, uh, signs, um, obviously people have the right to free speech, and we're not going to in any way infringe upon that right. But at the same time, both sides to this lawsuit have a right to a fair trial. And as far as we're concerned in this courtroom, that is the paramount uh, concern that we have, that both sides receive a fair trial. And the uh, important thing is that you as jurors make your decision based only on the evidence you hear in this courtroom and the instructions I give you on the law. Uh, will you all be able to do that? Do any of you feel that anything that has transpired by what you saw outside uh, will have any impact on your ability to follow uh, my instructions on the law and make your decision based on the evidence you hear in the courtroom? All right. And uh, will you put out of your mind whatever you saw and heard out there and make your decision based on only what happens here in the courtroom? Okay, and if these things happen in the future and whatever might occur and uh, you can visualize anybody coming out and putting, uh, displaying signs saying anything in the world, uh, again, uh, your decision is uh, and must be one made only on what you hear in this courtroom, your fair evaluation of the evidence in the courtroom and my instructions on the law. Will you all be able to do that? Yes. Okay. Um, other than what I have already discussed with you individually, has anybody, and other than what we've just discussed just now, has anybody been exposed to anything outside of the courtroom in any form whatsoever other than what you've already told me about? Okay, um, Mr. Emerson, uh, we'll talk to you. Uh, the lightning has struck again. Uh, uh, all right, um, anybody else? Okay. All right, then we'll discuss that with Mr. Emerson, and then uh, hopefully shortly we'll be able to start up again with the uh, testimony. So it shouldn't be very long, and I apologize for the delay, but I want to go through the uh, discussion with Mr. Emerson and then also with uh, the other jury, make the same inquiry of them as I have with you. And you should uh, understand that uh, neither side in this lawsuit had anything to do with what was uh, going on out there in the uh, uh, front of the courthouse, uh, that person has no connection with either side in this case, and you shouldn't draw any uh, inferences whatsoever in that regard. You all understand that as well? Okay. All right. If you'd all go back in the jury room, and we'll talk just briefly with Mr. Emerson. Okay, Mr. Emerson, you're on. You ought to just unload me, you know, I seem to be a magnet. <laughs> what happened this time? I was in a restaurant on Saturday afternoon, and uh, a couple of the next table, uh, I recognized the Alton Round building here, uh, this court. And, uh, I mean, a, somebody who works in a building? Well, or? I believe an employee, yeah. yeah. I've seen her here all along, so I assume she's an employee, and she seemed to have privilege to see the back corridors and what have you. Speaking to a companion, and, uh, and all I heard was, uh, and on the Menendez case, that and referring to you, uh, we're speaking to a commissioner, and you said something to Pam, and by this time I got to her table and asked her to be told it down. I couldn't move. Go through that one once more. She stated that she either was present or overheard you speaking to a commissioner, and I have no idea who. And it, uh, you then told something to Pam. I assume she means uh, prosecutor. And by this time, I had shut her up. And did you hear anything more? No, that's all I heard. And I didn't know even what that means. OK, well, um, none of that happened. As far as the uh, what that person was talking about, none of those things occurred. I can assure you of that. So with that, 
whatever you heard have any impact on how you decide this case? Would you put that out of your mind and make your decision based only on what happens in the courtroom? Sure. Did you draw any inferences from that? Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway. Okay, and would you um, refrain and uh, follow my instruction not to uh, say this, uh, anything about this to anybody else? Oh, yes. Okay. All right, thank you, sir. You can go back in the jury room. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, um, uh, did counsel have any inquiry of uh, Mr. Uh, Sullivan, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Emerson, uh, further along those lines? Okay, we can certainly try to um, have him identify that person if uh, he could. Um, Are there secretaries that work in the back that would be coming out to the public area? Well, there are court clerks and uh, people who work in the building. Um, I can uh, make a statement to you that I've never spoken to any commissioners about this case, and I obviously haven't spoken to Ms. Ferraro about this case, so, uh, or Ms. Bozanich about this case. So, um, I. Uh, as far as the basis of whatever it was he heard, I have no idea. Are there any other PAMs who work in the building or secretaries? Or anything? You got me. I really don't know. All right. Um, what we can do is have the bailiff discuss the matter further with Mr. Emerson and see if he can uh, assist in identifying that uh, individual. So when uh, we have a chance to do that, we'll have um, uh, that uh, discussion with Mr. Emerson to see if he can uh, pinpoint who it was that uh, um, he heard uh, making these statements. <laughs> well, he does seem to uh, be present uh, when uh, people talk, uh, but uh, he's also very forthright in bringing those matters to our attention. So, uh, yeah, well. Um, Let's go on to the other jury here and, uh, yeah. I don't think the record reflects what the placard said. Does the court want the record to reflect that? Um, I don't know if it really matters um, at this point. All right, let's get the other jury panel. Okay, um, in the trial we have the gold jury in the courtroom and um, let me uh, say that we're having a brief discussion with the jurors before we resume with the testimony. And the first thing I want to ask is whether or not any of you were outside the courthouse during the recess. If you have, would you? Okay, many of you were then. Uh, and did you happen to see the uh, lady with the uh, sign walking around? Any of you? Okay. And those of you who uh, did see it, did some of you then talk about it with the other jurors who might not have been outside? Just mention it. Did you say something to others? Uh, we were outside and we saw this and what the sign said. Okay. So do all of you understand pretty much what I'm asking about, whether or not uh, you're aware of uh, what was going on outside, somebody walking around with a sign? Okay. Um, let me then uh, say a few things about that. Uh, number one, uh, as you're aware, everybody has a right to free speech and free expression. People have a right to say and think what they want. But in this courtroom, the important thing for the jury to uh, understand is that uh, your role is to decide this case and make a fair decision based on the evidence presented in the courtroom and my instructions on the law. And my first question to all of you, uh, the 17 of you here, is whether or not anything you saw outside the courtroom uh, during this recess will have any impact or affect you in any way in your ability to make uh, a decision based on the evidence presented in the courtroom and my instructions on the law. Right. Will you all be able to uh, disregard whatever it is that you saw or uh, heard outside and make your decision based only on the evidence presented in the courtroom and my instructions on the law? All right. Okay, uh, I, I can't uh, account for what uh, other people think or uh, what someone writes or why they do things. That's, you know, within someone else's head. The important thing is that uh, you make your decision based only on what happens here in this courtroom and my instructions on the law. Will you all be able to do that? Okay. And um, you should also um, be assured that nobody involved in this case, neither side, has uh, any involvement in uh, what that person was doing, that uh, that person was acting 
on her own, and none of the parties involved in this case have any um, anything to do with that. And um, the important thing is that you will make a fair decision in this case, a, a decision that would be fair uh, to both sides. Would you be able to do that? Okay. All right, then um, let me ask all of you an additional question, whether or not any of you, other than what you've already told me uh, in other discussions, have any of you been exposed to anything about this case outside the courtroom in any form whatsoever? Okay. All right, then um, we'll proceed with the uh, trial. We'll get the other jury out and uh, Mr. Menendez back on the witness stand, and then we'll proceed. Okay, we have both jury panels uh, back in court. We're ready to resume with the cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Mr. Menendez, uh, again referring to October 31st, 1989, and uh, your session with Dr. Ozeal. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that uh, your father had yelled out no? Yes, I did. And did you tell Dr. Ozeal that your father was the first to die? I, I don't remember. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that your mother did not die uh, after the first volley of, of gunshots? Uh, yes. And that she was moaning and trying to crawl? I, I guess I said uh, she was trying to crawl. I recall my brother telling me that later. And you, so, actually, yes. you actually heard the moaning from your mother yourself? Yes. And you told Dr. Ozeal that? Yes. And uh, you, did you tell Dr. Ozeal that uh, you had to go out to reload the shotguns? I said that we had to go out to reload, yes. And did you tell Dr. Ozeal that uh, your brother Lyle went in and, and uh, finally killed your mother? Uh, no, I, I didn't say that um, at the time. Uh, Lyle and I believed that mom was already dead. Uh, I believe I also said that, but I definitely said that Lyle fired the last shot. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that you <clears throat> picked up the casings, the um, shotgun shell casings? Yes, I did. And did you tell Dr. Ozeal that you took a change of clothes with you? That I... After the shooting? I told them that I changed my pants, um, but I don't believe I would have said I took a change of clothes with me. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that both of you, you and your brother, had gotten <coughs> blood, blood on your clothing? Uh, I may have. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that you changed your clothing and put the clothing into a bag and then dumped it into a dumpster? Uh, yes. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that uh, you and your brother drove to Mulholland Drive and you took the shotguns and you took them down an embankment, the side of a hill, about 150 to 250 feet? No, I didn't tell him how far down, but I told him that we had gone to Mulholland Drive to, to dump the guns. How far did you tell him you took the guns down? I didn't tell him how far. At least I don't have any memory of telling him how far. Did you tell him, Dr. Ozeal, that you had covered the uh, guns up? I don't remember if I told him that. Did you, in fact, cover the guns up? I threw some branches, uh, not some branches, just some uh, loose dirt on them. I wasn't able to cover them up, though. After you covered up the, uh, the guns, uh, did you indicate to him that you, um, you had new clothing, you put the new clothing on, and you went to the party? Yeah, he gets that all uh, garbled up uh, in terms of sequence and how things happened, uh, or, or I'm sorry, when things happened. Um, but 
at some point I relayed everything that happened uh, after my parents died. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that you returned home after the, uh, the party and that you went into the house? I, I don't believe I used the word party, but I, I definitely told him that we turned home after the Taste of L.A. And did you tell Dr. Ozeal that you looked at your mother and father? Yes, I did. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that your father's head was bulging out? Yes, I did. And that parts of your mother and father were blown apart all over the room? Yes. Do you recall telling Dr. Ozeal that somebody called 911? Uh, I believe I said Lau called 911. I don't know what he says. Do you recall telling Dr. Ozeal that the police later let you and your brother go back to your cars that night? Uh, no, I, I didn't tell him that. I told him that. Uh, after the, uh, we had interviewed with uh, Detective Edmonds, uh, that we knew that uh, we had gone back to the car and they told us that we couldn't get into the car, that they had to search it, and that uh, we had left some shells in there and some papers in there, and that if they searched the car, we would have been arrested. And so that the next morning, um, we were able to manage to get into the car before they searched it essentially what I told him. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that since you had an alibi <coughs> being the party, that you, were, you and your brother were not immediately suspects? Uh, no, I wouldn't have told him that because the party, uh, this taste of LA wasn't an alibi. I'm sorry. It wasn't an alibi. You never told Dr. Ozeal that you had an alibi? I told him what I told the police about the movies and the taste of L.A., yes. You never referred to that as an alibi? Um, I may have. Now, did you tell Dr. Ozeal that uh, the police initially thought that the mafia or some business connection had um, murdered your parents? Yes, I did. I'm not sure, actually, if I told him that or that was common knowledge. Did you tell him that the guilt was overwhelming? Uh, yeah, I told him that it was uh, too hard to live with. Did you tell uh, Dr. Ozeal that the police had not recovered the weapons? Yes, we had talked about what the police knew. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that there was no way to link you and your brother since the fingerprints in the house were your fingerprints since you lived there? No, I, I told them uh, the, the one way that I thought they would link us eventually. You told Dr. Ozeal that you thought that uh, the police would link you through fingerprints? No, I, I told Dr. Ozeal that I thought they'd link us through uh, using my brother's ID. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal since there were no witnesses and since no one heard anything and since no one could link you and your brother to the weapons and the weapons were not found, that there was no way to link you to this crime? Uh, I told them that, that there was almost uh, no way to link us uh, to, the, to the crime other than the guns. I, I believe we even had a discussion about the fact that we were being taped while watching, uh, uh, while buying the guns, and that eventually uh, the police might be able to uh, find the tape. And I, I believe I asked him 
when they recycle those tapes or uh, something along those lines. I don't remember the exact part about it. You, you believe you had a discussion with Dr. Ozeal on October 31st, 1989, concerning your fear that the uh, video camera was operating when you made the purchase of the guns in San Diego? Yes, I'm almost positive when he was talking about what the police knew. I was telling him everything that, that the police could know or might know or might find out and didn't know. Did you or your brother at any time call down to a big five uh, concerning how long they kept their videotapes? No, we didn't, we didn't call. But you were concerned about that? I was concerned about that, yes, afterwards. I didn't want to go to jail. Did you tell Dr. Ozeal that you believed there was no way to tie you or your brother into buying the weapons at the San Diego gun store? No, I told him just the opposite. You told him that there was a way for the police to find you? Yes, Through? I told them that if they checked the tape or if they linked um, Donovan Goodrow, uh, that they would, they would find him. And I specifically remember it because Donovan had called the house. Um, Detective Zoller, uh, I guess told Lyle and Lyle told me or something like that, that Donovan Goodrow had called the house that morning or the next day after my parents had died and had spoken with Detective Zoller and uh, we figured that he'd link it up. Donovan Gaudreau didn't know where his license was, did he? No, he didn't. Objection, I call some speculation. Over. Sir, did you, tell, did you call Donovan Gaudreau and tell him on the 18th of August that you had used his license to purchase shotguns? Certainly not. So there's no way that even Donovan would know that you purchased shotguns on his license, isn't that right? No, I'm not saying Donovan would know that. No, definitely not. In fact, it wasn't your picture on that license. I didn't think the picture mattered. It wasn't your name on the license. No, it was a friend of my brother's. And it was a, a fake ID that you used in a town 120 miles from here that you used to purchase these shotguns, correct? Uh, yes. And you told Dr. Ozeal that there was no way on earth to link you and your brother to the purchase of those shotguns in San Diego, isn't that correct? No, I told him just the opposite. You told him that the police would find out that you had used your brother's uh, acquaintance's ID to buy shotguns in San Diego. You thought that? No, I, uh, I told him that the police might find out, and that's why we had the discussion about how long the, the uh, tapes of a, of a monitor that monitors, monitors everything that happens in a gun transaction last. And uh, I, 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 Donovan was one of my brother's old best friends, um, and I explained that to him, not that he was an acquaintance. Did you think that the police had any idea whatsoever that you had used a bogus ID in purchasing these shotguns? No, I didn't know uh, that they, I was hoping that they didn't know that, and I, I I had figured that they didn't know that since they hadn't arrested us, um, but I knew that they were, we were the main suspects at that point. On October 31st, you believed you were not suspects? No, I believed that we were. Uh, I started believing it after the conversation with Detectives Zola on the 17th. Of September? Yes. Was that... Uh, do you, do you recall having another conversation with Detective Zoller on October 24th? Objection, Your Honor. Yeah, the basis. Can you discuss this at this time? Had you uh, gotten that uh, piece of paper that... Uh, yes, Your Honor. Did you want to discuss that? I'm sure we can. 